Man, I'm not sure what the deal was with this dog, man, but I know they don't eat fish, so it makes no sense in the world why it did this to me. Listen, I've been fishing on Lake Saudis for years, trolling along the bank right alongside of the Graham Wildlife Management Area. Up until this point, it had been a peaceful day. I done caught a boatload of fish. I'm thinking about headed back to the marina and going home when it sounds like something tears through the trees and dives into the water. I know you can't possibly understand what I mean by something tearing through the trees, so I'm going to try my best to describe to you what it sounded like. Imagine this. You take an armored truck, drop it about 100 yards into the woods just off the shore of the lake, put John Wick behind the steering wheel, and tell John Wick that his dog is on the boat with me, and that's what it sounded like. Trees shaking, limbs breaking, leaves rustling, and then a giant caboose. That's exactly what the hell it sounded like and then things went quiet for about two minutes and then I noticed a big furry black mass swimming through the water in my direction. Listen, I don't know if you ever found yourself in a situation where something was happening that was just unbelievable. I'm standing there holding a the fishing rod in my hand saying, man, this cannot be possible. I have to be hallucinating. But as this thing swam faster and faster and got closer, I realized that there's absolutely no way that this is a hallucination. This is real. Something swimming through this water coming for me. Now, in full disclosure, I have lived in the area around this lake my entire life. And yes, I have heard about these creatures. I heard about them long before anybody started speaking about them on YouTube. But I had never, ever seen one. And what I was looking at with my own two eyes was a furry black monster swimming through the water coming directly at me. And when I tell you right now that that thing made me get some act right and get the hell out of there, understand the situation that I'm in. I'm pulling up to the boat marina. There are people smiling, laughing, giggling, having fun, but I'm absolutely terrified getting my boat out of that water. And it's not like I could turn around and tell the closest person, hey man, you know I saw a werewolf over there on the other side of the lake can't say that so now I'm driving my boat away headed home and when I get home the only thing I can do is sit there on the porch and come to terms with it so I open a cold beer sit there and come to the realization that what my great-grandfather told me about this area was true that they are real monsters around Lake Sardis everybody around here knows it but you kind of get to the point to where you suppress it push it down in the back of your mind and say nothing like that could ever happen to me well, it happened to me, man. It happened. What's happening, ladies and gentlemen? It's the one and only Dog Waters, and I wanted to bring this to your attention. Many of you have may already seen this. I just found this because someone sent it to me and I wanted to give my opinion and get your opinion on it. Zookeeper spots wild bipedal dog like creature and nobody knows what it is. That looks like a hoax to me. Um, the size of this doesn't look anywhere near the size it's supposed to be. The It, it, it looks like a person in a suit with a, with a wolf, hell, uh, wolf mask on. Um, everyone knows the internet loves a good mystery which is why there's been plenty of amusing responses to the above photo on Reddit. Yeah, I, I think this is a hoax. I would like to see the video of it. If anybody's seen the video of this, let me know. But that looks like a 100% pure D hoax. Let me see if there is any video. The user responsible for the snap clarified that two people hadn't seen anything like this before on their automated cameras. Da -da -da, post it. Yeah, guys, I want to hear your opinion on this. What do you think it looks like? I think that's a hoax. And when we start going back to the source, Reddit, let's see where it came from on Reddit. No. It won't take us back to that. The thread. Yep, this. I think this person called it right here. Yep, whoever this is, it's a furry. That, that's exactly what it reminds me of. Somebody who's dressed up as a furry. Give me your opinion on it. What you think. That's that's ex exactly what it is. I, I think, And I even had showed you guys some images of furries. 
So that's a person dressed up in a furry costume. Uh, furry, the right furry outfit will scare the hell out of you, though. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's a furry, man. I told y'all them furries be wild, man. Watch out for them furries, dude. They on some next level stuff. For real. Look, I've been working in the woods my entire life. And where I'm from in rural Kentucky, ain't no office jobs, no cubicles. It's just all outdoors, back-breaking work. I worked in the logging industry. I bought and sold cars, worked on farms, did pipeline maintenance. When I tell you I've done all kinds of jobs to make ends meet, I've done damn near everything. These particular incidents happened when I was working as a maintenance man on a farm. Imagine a scene. It's early in the morning, 6.30 a.m. The sun has just risen. I'm over on the right-hand side of this farm working on a hog's pit. I'm there with my back turned to the wood line repairing the barbed wire fence on this hog's pen when I get this feeling, just eerie, creepy feeling that I'm being watched so damn strong that I have to turn around and stare into the woods. So now I'm standing there with my back turned to the hog, staring into the woods, looking, looking, trying to see what out there is looking back at me because I can clearly, clearly feel it looking. Now, if you're like me, you spent a lot of time in the woods, you know that it's very rare for the woods to be quiet and still. And this weird dynamic was taking place. Behind me was the farm and I heard all the sounds of the farm animals. I heard the hogs, I heard the chickens, I heard the cows, I heard everything. But in front of me, in the woods, there were no birds chirping, no nothing. It was just dead silent. So I'm staring as hard as I can. I'm telling you, I can feel something looking at me. And that's when I noticed this shimmering. It's a shimmering about 12 feet up in the air. I'm squinting my eyes, locking in on it. And I know this sounds crazy, but it looks like a shimmering circle with this face protruding out of it. And I'm, and I'm telling you, this face looked exactly like what everybody described as a Bigfoot, except for it had these huge, gigantic ram horns on it. You know how the ram's horns go up, back, and curl? Imagine a Bigfoot face, big old wide nose, big old brow, humanoid lips, but with ram's horns. I stand there for a second looking at it blinking and I can clearly see it and then the shimmering goes away and it's gone. The minute that's gone everything goes back to feeling normal. I'm standing there I'm freaked out. I actually go inside and tell Mr. Ross the owner of the farm that hey man there's some weird stuff going on in your woods but he looks at me like I'm crazy and I need this job so I'm not about to do nothing to mess it up. Two three weeks pass I just so happened to be back over there on the side by the hog pen doing some more work. I open the pen door to go in and one of those hogs come hauling tail out of there, takes off into the woods. Now I close the door back. I'm watching this hog run off into the woods saying to myself, boy, if this thing gets away, Mr. Ross is going to fire me. Imagine the scene. I'm chasing this hog through the woods and it's running for me like I'm trying to put it on a dinner plate. And that's when one of the freakiest things I've ever seen happens in the woods. The hog is directly in front of me. I'm running it down and it runs past this giant, I mean huge, giant oak tree. And I see, don't think I saw, I see a huge forearm and hand reach out from behind that tree and grab that hog. You hear it squeal and then it snatches it right back behind that tree. I need to put yourself in my shoes for a moment and imagine what I saw. I'm running full speed, man, full speed. And this hand and forearm, the forearm, the size of my freaking thigh, reaches out, grabs this hog with one hand and snatches it. Dude, I come to a sliding stop, almost fall on my face, and I'm terrified. Thinking to myself, hold on, did I just see that? Did I just see that? Where's the hog? 
in my mind I'm saying to myself okay you're hallucinating maybe the hog got caught in some kind of hunting trap I stand there for a solid 30 seconds and then get enough courage to move forward and go next to that tree and when I get right next to that freaking tree man that hog is not there the hog is gone there is nothing on the other side of that freaking tree it is literally like an arm reached out from another dimension and snatched that hog right in front of me bro let me tell you something at that point in time i really really needed that job on mr ross's farm i had just bought my fiance her ring i put it on credit and i needed to be able to pay for that ring but let me tell you what i did I quit that job mm-hmm after seeing that I quit that job there was no way there was no way in hell I was gonna be working out there with things appearing out of nowhere and snatching hogs nope hell no What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's the one and only James Williams Darkwaters, and I'm back with another phenomenal interview with a woman that I have grown to love. And I'm going to explain to you guys why I've grown to love her. I haven't spent a lot of time talking to her, but I've grown to love and appreciate the abilities that she has. Um, when we had the Dogman Camps project up and running before it ran into its wall and faltered and all the drama that everybody knows about, Wendy was a person who could literally look at the screen and find these Bigfoot at the drop of a dime. And I thought it was absolutely amazing that she had an eye for seeing this. And it wasn't wrong. It was literally every time she sent me something, something was there. Sometimes I couldn't completely decipher what it was until she put lines around it. And then I'm like, holy crap, that's a face right there. But she has a marvelous, a marvelous eye for seeing these things. So we're going to talk to Wendy. We're going to get into how she developed that eye. We're going to get into her YouTube YouTube channel, uh, Turquoise and Sasquatch. She has Bigfoot on her property. We plan on talking about that and how it's affected her and her family. And then we're going to have a little conversation about faith and from a Christian perspective, what we think these are and what maybe some of the limitations they have and what we can do to get rid of them if we want to. But and without any more further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to Miss Wendy. Well, reintroduce because she's been around. Miss Wendy Wilson. Wendy, <laughs> Wendy, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I'm actually honored to be here. Thank you. I, I and appreciate I appreciate that. you also. <laughs> no, thank you, Wendy. You, you're a phenomenal, amazing woman. I um, We wanted to highlight you in that article because one of the things that I've noticed and this goes back to a conversation I had with Linda Godfrey. This had to be four years ago. We're talking about um, some of the things going on in the dogman community and the cryptic community. And she said, James, if there's one thing I can ask you to do for me that you would do. She said, deal with one person in particular. And I'm not going to say that. And then she said, we need to figure out a way to have more women involved in this field. And if, if you can find a way to highlight women in this field. I think it's something that needs to be done. And I was like, you know what, Miss Linda? If anybody can pull that off, it's me. And I say, you have my word. Mm -hmm. So um, you are one Thank of the women you. that come to mind. You really, really are. So let's start here. How mm -hmm. in the world are you able to see these things? Literally, how are you able to spot those with your eyes? Because you do it all the time. Yes. I think the reason why is because um, when I first started finding footprints here, um i started seeing like huge um bear like feet on the grass and i brought it to my husband's attention and i'm like there's like footprints here and um my stepson and they were fresh um and you know footprints and they were like no it's nothing they didn't see it so 
what I began to do was like, I was actually seeing them with the naked eye. And I thought, I know that they're there. So I started taking pictures. So I took pictures constantly. And then I started to learn my property. I started to like kind of like know my trees, know the areas. And then I started to notice like the difference um, in like the shadows, um, just a difference. And even when I took a picture, there were some areas that looked kind of blurry um, and other areas that looked normal. So then I started focusing on the blurry areas. And then I started to see, you know, faces and figures. Um, and basically it just started because I wanted evidence. I wanted to say, look, I am seeing these things. Um, something is here. And it was actually to prove it to kind of my husband, <laughs> my family. Um, and then it was almost like to prove it to myself. No, you're not crazy. You are seeing these creatures. They are there. And then the minute um, I have really close friends that I trust, and I was sending um, them pictures. And they're from Texas, and they're Bigfoot believers. And at first, some of the pictures, they were like, well, they weren't really sure. But then the more I sent pictures, they were like, oh, my gosh, there is something there. So um, that kind of got me to like, okay, I'm going to keep, and I took pictures, I take pictures everywhere. Um, then I started to notice like the features, um, you know, like the deep brow area, uh, the noses, um, some have like more of a flat nose. Um, you were talking to Carrie, I believe it was yesterday or the day yes, before. Yes, that was um, last he, night. Yeah. Last night. Okay. So um, he had a picture there. Of course, the green face. You can clearly see the green face there. But there was the other one. Um, and that one looked more like a round face. And the nose was like wide and almost flat. So you kind of notice like those features. Um, so it's kind of easier to pick out once you kind of get an idea of what you're looking for. So that's how come I started to kind of see um, just because the brow area, it's, it's thick, um, and some look more human-like, and others look more, to me, more monkey-like. So I think I just started taking a ton of pictures, and I can see um, here on my property, for some reason, I can sense uh, when they're around, I can sense where I need to point my camera, and then I just take pictures and they're there so you can actually sense them you know because blue down in florida when we started mm -hmm. really talking day in and day out i said blue how do you find these things he said james i can look at the woods and i feel them and i start taking pictures in the area where they are and blue would call it he yes. didn't call it zooming in he said i'd zoom in he said when i zoom in they're there and he said it doesn't matter yeah. where i'm at i can see them and he's like, I can go by my mother's yeah. house, and they're there, and I can say, okay, something's looking at me. He snaps the picture, and then he zooms in, yes. and it's there. And I don't know what that is. Um, I noticed I, I started to have that after I started seeing them with the naked eye. After, I don't know what happened. I don't know what, you know, I just, I felt um, like I, I always feel like I'm being watched. Every time I go outside... I have a sense of something watching me and I kind of look at my, and like he, like he says, I know where to look and I can sense that there's something there and I take pictures and there they are. I have no idea how I have that, you know, because I didn't have that before. Um, I don't know if it, if it was after, I mean, because I went a whole year living here, probably about a year and a half, um, or a little bit under a year and a half, and I didn't know anything. I didn't sense anything until I started finding footprints. And then it was like after I started finding footprints, it's like the activity ramped up, and then I started seeing them. And it's almost like they were uh, coming to my property, like daily on all fours. Every morning I would walk outside, I would find footprints, either whether it was just like a foot 
or um, hand, like like as if they came on all fours. Um, and it's almost like their activity ramped up. Um, so I, I don't understand. That I haven't been able to figure out yet, like how that happened. Were they aware that I was able to see them? And then maybe they thought, oh, she can see us. Um, and then it's it's kind of like it it picked up. I, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you I don't what, know what happened there. I, I, it has to have something to do with bravery, in my opinion, because like even where I live now, there's some nights, some nights where I can go outside and I feel like something's watching me and I'm in a city and I can tell you where it's watching me mm -hmm. from. But I don't have the kahunas to take my cell phone and take a picture because I really don't want to see what's watching me. I'm like, I know yeah. something's there. I just it, it just takes a certain level of bravery to actually do what you do and handle it the way you handle it. It really, really, really does. And I think you just develop the eye for seeing them. That's why I called you the eagle eye. I mean, there's people mm -hmm. who would send me photos and, and I stopped like I stopped watching and looking at people's photos because they would send me a photo. And it would be nothing in it, but they would send me 20, 30 photos and there's nothing there, right? Then mm -hmm. you started sending photos and I'm like, no, there's something there. There's something there. There's something in this one. Just like the last one with the portal. That's a, yeah. that's a freaking yeah, portal. Yeah, that one. <laughs> and you know, the funny thing about that one is I take lots of pictures and that one was still, I mean, it wasn't even dark yet. It started to get dark. So I really didn't think to really look at it because I'm thinking nothing is going to be there. It's not even dark. Like, I mean... We were we had just started um, the fire, and when I'm, I'm I was looking back, is um, Sean had a show about um, like you know questioning does dogmen exist, and then I thought, well, I actually captured eye shine, and the eye shine is really weird um, because it almost looks like it's on the sides of the head. It's not like straight like a human or you know somebody said it doesn't look like it's a Bigfoot just because their eyes are more, you know, on like the front, the eye shine almost looked like it was on the sides and that creeped me out. So I started kind of looking for more pictures that I had like um, two sets of eyes and the ones that I had two sets of eyes in, they looked the same, like they were almost on the side of the, you know, head. So anyway, I was looking for that, you know, eye shine when I typed in, you know, because I have so many pictures, I guess, on my cloud. And I typed in, like, um, I can't remember, campfire. I think that's what I typed in. So, it, you know, it brings up all my pictures that I take with, like, you know, when we're having a fire. And then that one came across, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's something there. And it actually does look like something on all fours. And it's like, and it's like almost like a... A circle of smoke, kind of. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I didn't hear anything. I was out there with my husband. We didn't hear or see anything. But in that picture, it, he's. The, I actually showed it to him, and he's the one that said it looks like it, there's a portal, and it's it's not coming into this realm. It's almost like it's looking from like that it's, it's realm speaking into in this from one. that realm yep that's exactly what i saw it was like it was looking it's like the portal open and it was looking from that realm at into what you guys were doing but it hadn't come all the way yes. through that was crazy it had not come. yeah I, I thought that was, that just blew me away because i'm like oh my gosh and it was huge yeah it was um, massive I, and, that Man, yeah. I'm going to tell you, Wendy, I've seen a lot of photos that you've sent. I've seen the stuff from Dogman Cams that you were highlighting. That one right there, I was mm -hmm. like, whoa, that's a portal. And that's something, like, it looked like a head coming out of the portal. I was like, and then on top yes. of that, it's huge. It's extremely mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. And, and, and like, where do I, where I put that? <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I don't know how to explain that kind of stuff. I mean, I've seen them in... They are huge. And the funny thing is, like I've mentioned it to my family, my mom, and, you know, you know my windows. They're um, those triangle windows. They're like nine feet up in the air. Yes. And I've caught faces there. And they're like, whoa, where, what are they standing on? And I'm thinking, I don't know. But that face is huge. And it's taken most of that window. So it's not like a, nor it's not small because our faces are tiny. If, if we, when we take pictures in front of those windows, 
our faces are small. These faces are huge. So I don't, I mean, I don't know if they're standing on, I mean, I don't think they're standing on anything. I just think they're huge. Nah, but they're, it's, it's kind of hard. Massive. Yeah. Um, let, let's, let me ask you this question. So we have mm -hmm. this activity on your property. I know for a fact, you know, when we first started like the dog man cams thing and I was, I was saying, Hey, talk to your husband and see if he wanted to put a camera in there. And he was like, nah, I don't know if I want to yes. put one there. Cause we got family members out there. Yeah. I don't know if he was a mm -hmm. skeptic of these things at this point in time. Where, where is he now as it pertains to this activity? I know at one point in time he was like, nah, that's not oh my it. Gosh, no, Where is he at he now? Doesn't, yeah. He, he's changed. Um, he's definitely, uh, you know, he knows that they're out there now at the time when you, um, when you and I were talking and I was excited because I'm like, yeah, I would love to, you know, see. And he was like, no, you know, because he was like, you know, what, what did they don't, you know, there's nothing out there and we're going to be out there working and it's going to be strangers looking into, you know, our property. And, 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 um, and then after that, because I talked to him a second time and I'm like, you know, I think it would be a good idea. And he was like, well, what if they catch something? And then he was like, our life is going to change. You know, it's not going to be quiet anymore. People are going to get curious and they're going to want to know and see where we live. Um, so I understood that. I understood um, where he was coming from. So at that point, I figured, well, he's worried that it is going to catch something. He knows that there's something here. Now, um, we've had kind of encounters recently and I believe that he's had also, he just didn't tell me. Um, I got sick probably in 2018. It's 2018. And he was worried about me. And he would he couldn't sleep. So he would um, stand on our deck. Uh, I guess it would be like midnight, one in the morning. Just because, you know, he couldn't sleep. He was worried. And he's this is, is the time that he did when well, that's when he told me he had something happen. He said that he was out there and he heard um, like pebbles being kind of picked up and dropped, picked up and dropped. And then he heard like a little, like a, a grunt. He actually got scared and he said, you know, I'm out here. I guess we were all sleeping. And he was like, if something happens to me, nobody's going to know. So he came in the house. And I think it happened to him two nights in a row. And then he he didn't go back out um, at night anymore. So he's heard it. Um, he's also has seen shadows. Um, and then he had about two weeks ago, he had something where he thought, I mean, I don't know if it was just a regular animal. Um, he was... Um, he had been working in the garden and it started to get dark already. And, you know, he's putting everything away and then he's walking through our woods and our dog um, took off chasing. He thought it was an animal. But then after that, like um, it was dark and he didn't have a flashlight or anything, but whatever it was, it was approaching, like it was coming towards him. And he wow. was like, uh, yeah, it, I mean, he didn't have any, like he had like, um, it's like, it was like a fork that he was working in the garden with. That's all he had. And he actually ended up hitting it on, we have like some stepping slabs there and he hit it on that. And it actually sounded like a gunshot. Cause I, I was in the, I was on the porch and I heard it, but I thought it was our neighbor and he, and he did it three times and it sounded like three gunshots. And after he did that, like it stopped and, but he didn't know where it went. Like he had no clue. Like he didn't hear it come forward or leave. It was just gone. And we went out looking, you know, to see, cause at this time he's thinking it's, you know, it's, it's an animal. Um, we didn't hear. I mean, we, both of us kind of went out and we're walking the woods and, um, we did hear something maybe like 15 minutes later because we were walking and we both heard something. I thought I heard something coming on all fours, like towards us. And he he actually said there's some it's galloping 
towards us. Wow. And yeah, it, it, I don't know how to explain it, but I know that people, I mean, would be fearful. I didn't feel fear. Like I didn't, it was almost like, I don't see it. Like whatever it is, it stopped. It didn't. And it was, it was kind of close to where we were standing. Um, and, I, I, you know, we kind of stood there silent for a few minutes and we didn't hear it anymore. So we went, we kind of walked to where we heard the sound and there was nothing there. We walked the property. Um, we stood out there for like, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes and we didn't hear it again. So, I mean, I don't know what it was, but we both of us heard it and he's heard more stuff to where I think he is a believer. Like he takes me to, um, Bigfoot conferences. And I mean, he, you know, he was like, you know, when I, when I, when you were talking about, oh, you know, having like a YouTube channel and everything, I was like, oh, maybe I should do that. I can put my pictures on there. And he was like, yeah, if you want to do it. <laughs> Then I'm like, oh my gosh, she's open to me doing that and talking about it. Wow. That's so, a big turnaround right there. Because he was like, nah, yes. I will pass. Yeah, he was, yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah, nah, bro, he, we're going to pass. At the beginning, <laughs> yeah, he, he did not want to have anything to do. I mean, he didn't even look at my pictures. He did not look at my pictures. The first time he actually looked at my pictures was we were going to a Bigfoot conference. And I'm like, I want to take pictures because I want to show some, you know, because researchers are there and I wanted to show them and I wanted to say, what do you think? Like, you know, is this something? So I had him print them out for me on his computer. And that was the first time he ever saw. Like, and, and I think I saw his face and it's almost like he didn't realize the stuff that I had caught. Right. So, so it's saying it reality really sank in and set in on him saying, whoa. This is something yes. that I, even I can see. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. that's a tough spot to be in. But I, I tell you what, I think it's amazing that, you know, he's supporting you and helping you. Because I remember you saying he's a sponsor of your channel and he got you all your equipment. I think yes. it's amazing. He got my stuff. Yeah. He, and he's kind of like, you know, he lets me, um, you know, do and he'll ask me, how's it going? Um, I'm not very <laughs> like when it comes to the tech stuff, I don't know. I'm more like arts and crafts, but, right. um, you know, I'm trying. Yeah. But well, no, he's very okay. supportive. And, you know, this whole thing is a learning process. Um, it really, really is a learning process. It's the learning of the technology. Then it's the learning of the communication and, and how to, how it's supposed to flow and how the words are supposed to mm -hmm. fly out of your mouth. It's really a learning process, but you're going to be phenomenal at it. And I, I firmly believe that as time passes and certain people kind of, jettison off and grow bigger you're going to be huge mm -hmm. in this community because i i talk to everybody wendy i talk to mm -hmm. pretty much every big host of every big podcast and i talk to everybody we talk about evidence we talk about all these crazy things but none of them have an eye for it you know i even sent some of your pictures to dave schrader um oh, wow. he has connections with a bunch of tv shows and mm -hmm. i put i grouped them in with a bunch of other pictures and i said dave what mm -hmm. do you think and so he called me back and he says, well, this one, I see a face. This one, I see a face. This one, I see a face. These are blurry. Every last one where he saw a face, it was one of yours. It was either one of the oh, ones wow. that you sent me before or something you caught mm -hmm. on Dogman Cam. So, um, nah, you have an eye for this. You really, really do. And just be encouraged and keep on going and, and, and keep on pursuing it. And just don't let the algorithm uh, deter you because YouTube's algorithm is really really unfair the way yes. it does things you know yeah and i have to figure out because right now it's our busy season because we have like my gosh we have to take care of land and garden and the house we have a big house so it's almost like oh <laughs> well by the time i'm done <laughs> i'm exhausted um right. and i do want to you know i i know i have a, a loyal following right now and i have you know i love um all the people that comment and, and I appreciate every one of them. And it's like, I want to be able to keep in touch with them and let them know, you know, what's going on. And, um, you know, I get so many positive messages. So that kind of gets me, you know, it keeps me like encouraged to keep going. 
Well, I'll make a suggestion to you. So instead of sitting down mm -hmm. and doing it formally like you're doing, if you just want to keep in contact, mm -hmm. just download the app on your phone. And when you're out in the garden, shoot a short and say, hey, guys, I'm out in the garden and I'm growing, you know, these are tomatoes, blah, blah, blah. And I heard mm -hmm. something over here today and I just wanted to show you guys the area. And so you're in constant communication with your audience because you're I constantly you know, updating them. Yeah, because uh, we had this happen with my husband. We were in the garden. Well, we're always in the garden. But this particular day, um, we were both in there. And this doesn't really, like, this doesn't happen. Like, they're very quiet here. But this particular um, day, we were in there, and we heard something big, like, coming. It was breaking branches. Like, it sounded loud. And we both looked at each other because we both heard it. And we looked towards, it was like towards the end of our woods. There's a bunch of brush uh, at the end of our wood line. And we're looking, we're not, we don't see anything. And it's like, oh my gosh, like we can hear it. We just don't see it. And after, you know, it stopped because we were looking at it. We were looking at that area and then it stopped. So I asked him, like, do you want to go check it out? And he was like, yeah. So we both walked over and we were, you know, looking, but we had so much rain lately that the mosquitoes are like really, really bad. And they started swarming us once we got to the wood line. So it was like, we, we were only there for like a few minutes and then it's like, all right, we're going to turn back and we didn't see anything, but no. it, that doesn't happen here. No, I got you. You know, I was thinking, uh, I was talking to one of these guys, I think it was carry on or one of them. And I was thinking, you know, mm -hmm. if you really want to try and find some Bigfoot DNA, what you have, what you probably need to do is harvest mosquitoes in the area where they are and then start sampling mm -hmm. the blood inside the mosquitoes. And you should because they got to feed on these things. They got to bite them. Right. right. So you should yeah. be able to harvest the mosquitoes and get the DNA. And I was like, ah, I should do that. Then I was like, ah, oh, that sounds real expensive. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. you think about it, that would be a good way to find some DNA because they, they have to feed on blood. And if you're not out there, right. they're feeding on animal blood and deer blood and those things out there, they definitely biting them. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. They're, they're trying to. Well, I, I did find um, hair. Okay. I had at the time this one year, this is probably like uh, 2019, 2020. Um, I had hanging baskets, you know, there's those hooks that you kind of put in the ground and then you hang, hang the hanging baskets on it. That was in the in front of my house, right by our sidewalk and, you know, our front door. Mm -hmm. And I was watering my plants one morning and then I came across, I was watering the hanging baskets when I noticed a chunk of hair on the these hanging baskets had like the coconut husk, you know, how they have like, it's the, the, I guess, metal wire. And then there's like a coconut husk. And then you can put the earth, the, like the dirt and then the flower. Well, on the coconut husk, there's like this uh, chunk of hair that I found. And I'm like, uh, it was, that was high up off the ground. I mean, it's a hanging basket. Um, it probably came down to my shoulder where like the bottom of the hanging basket so I'm, i was thinking it can't be like a, a dog it can't be like a like an animal because it wouldn't be that high so i did collect it and i do have it in a in a like paper envelope but i did i have found hair around here i mean i don't know i know i heard that it was expensive to get the dna i don't know i mean if you want and, if you want to try and get it tested, we probably can find somebody to test it. We'll talk about it. Um, somebody okay. somebody knows somebody and get it tested. Or maybe I can reach out to someone like a Melba Kitchen that's already doing that stuff. And maybe we can get in contact with them and have them tested. But we can work it out. I didn't know you had that. So mm -hmm. we can definitely we can definitely check. Oh, it yeah, out. I, I have. I have. Um, I've also, um, you know, fingerprints. Uh, they leave fingerprints on my siding and um, just different places. And I have a friend, he said, you know, get a Q-tip, kind of go around um, the fingerprints and then, um, you know, of course, wear gloves and get the Q-tip and then put it in uh, an envelope and collect it and just keep it, you know, documented. So I have a lot of like that kind of stuff just because I've, I've gone, I mean, they leave like dermal ridges. 
And wow. I I mean I I think they're like oily because I've tried like on my siding, I've gone with a water hose and it does not come off. Like it's hard to get that stuff off. On the windows, like my husband's washed the windows. I mean, it does not come off easily. And we're talking about like he's scrubbing it with soap and water and it doesn't come off or he just sprayed yeah. water on it. Well, I've just sprayed water just with the water hose, but he's cleaned the windows. We had a thumbprint. Um, the window, it's probably about seven feet high, and there was a thumbprint left. And that one, my husband scrubbed it. Like, he was cleaning the windows. You know, he cleans the windows, like, in the spring and fall. And um, he was scrubbing it, and there was still a little bit left, residue left on there. Like, it that didn't... That's creepy. Take it off with soap and water. That's creepy, man. Like I, like that's too much for me. Like I, that's you guys are bold because I would be like, mm -mm, y'all touching my house, you're leaving fingerprints on my window. <laughs> yeah. I had to be out there. I, I would spaz out. Yeah, it, it's something you have. It's it's one of the things where you have to. I've adjusted my life to that. And he, when we bought this house, he used to love to walk outside, and he would walk like at midnight without a flashlight. Like he would just walk the property, and then when I started mentioning that there were things here, he doesn't he doesn't do that anymore. Like he'll take a big flashlight, and he doesn't walk it as often as he used to. And it's just I don't know. I guess uh, we've I've adjusted my life. Like I I love windows. I used to love windows, and you know have the windows kind of. I mean we still have them open just because we need the light in here, but um. As soon as it starts getting dark, everything gets shut down. The house gets close, closed down, and we're in. Like, we don't. We're not outside. Yeah, I, I know. That's it's just that's life-altering. Let, let me ask you a few questions mm -hmm. about this house, right? So when you yeah. guys mm -hmm. first acquired this house, did, the pre, you, did you build it or did you buy it from someone? Well, we bought it. It was already, like, I mean, it was already had a huge garden, um, we actually were looking at the house next door to this and, uh, we were going to put a, an offer on the house next door. And then we kind of came across this one and, um, my husband liked it. Um, he was like, oh, we should look into that one also. At the time it was already under contract. So, uh, which the funny thing is, I don't, I, about, I think it was maybe like a week later, a realtor called us and said um, that the contract fell through on this house that we were able, if we wanted to come look at it, we could. So we did. We came to look at it. We loved the land. Um, it looked like a park to us. Um, so we, we bought it. Um, but it was already built. Like the owners, it was, uh, they were only, I don't think they had any, they just had pets. And they were really big into gardening because their garden was huge and they had all kinds of vegetables and everything in there. Wow. And it wasn't, but it wasn't anything like you guys got the house at a steal. It was full price. It wasn't no steep discount. It didn't seem like they were trying to run of anything, right? Well, we made an offer for a lot less of what they were asking for and they took it. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so at the time we thought, oh my gosh, we, we thought, you know. We got a we, deal. <laughs> we got a really great deal, yeah. <laughs> um, the thing about it is I don't know. I mean, they didn't, I mean, they knew I had children. So you would think that if they knew that there was something was here, they would have said, oh, she's coming. I mean, my kids weren't little. They were already like older. I think they were like probably 10 and 15. Uh, but still, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I would have thought that they would have said, hey, you know, or I mean, I don't know. And none of the neighbors, like uh, when I first started, my husband actually started asking them, hey, is there anything strange around here? Are there any Bigfoots? And they laughed. The neighbors laughed at us. So we figure, well, <laughs> you know, we don't want to be the crazy neighbors that think that there's stuff here. But nobody else seems to except for one neighbor. We have one that actually believes that they are he like they exist. Everybody and, and else. How is close like, is no. that person to you? How close are they to you? Okay, at the time it was an empty lot between us, and now a guy bought the empty lot and he's got his house. So it's um, 
there's one lot in between us and then it's his house. So we are very like close. Yeah, that sounds that's the whole situation of suspect. So when you guys went there, this house was up for sale. The house next door was up for sale. And you guys are looking yeah. at both those houses. These people mm -hmm. lay up here and take a reduced offer. They take it and they roll out. Uh, yeah, and that sounds that whole situation sounds like everybody knows what's going on. And at least in that, yeah. you know, that little one four house range of that block, you know, from left to right, people know what's going on. I think it's I always mm -hmm. think it's amazing when people say, you know, they talk to their neighbors and their neighbors laugh like they're crazy. Yeah, they laughed. Yeah, they laughed at us. And I mean, I figure, OK, I'm not I'm not going to bring, you know, I don't want to be like the new neighbors that are like the crazy new neighbors that think that there's Bigfoot here. So I just I never brought it back up until I only talked to the one neighbor that believes that they're you know they exist and he's heard things here so him and i do talk and i send him pictures and but um that's it well what kind of laugh when we because there's so much that goes into um when you're talking to people so for example there's different laughs right there's a mm -hmm. there's a a laugh like you know bent over at the waist laughing like you cracked the joke then there's that uncomfortable laugh like i don't know what to say to you so I'm just going to laugh it off. Was it like mm -hmm. that kind of like, <laughs> like, you know, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I'm just going to laugh at it. Cause I don't want to, cause it may be that they don't want to sound crazy and they don't want to come in and agree. What kind of laugh was yeah. it? It wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, you know, like, oh, that's a, it wasn't that kind of laugh. It was, it wasn't, it was almost like in between. Cause, um, I was standing next to my husband when we asked, cause it was all the guys, you know, the guys were kind of standing there and he was like, so, Hey, and he was talking to them. And these men are, they're older. Um, they're older. Some of them are like um, military retired. And um, they were just like, no, like those things don't exist. And it, it, it wasn't like ridicule laugh, but it wasn't either like, oh, like a nervous, almost like an in-between kind of like i don't want to believe that exists so no those things don't exist like yeah i'm just gonna yeah. throw, like i'm throwing it out of my mind forget about it no that doesn't exist like eh, mm -hmm. i'm not sure if yeah. it do exist or not but i'm gonna throw this yeah. out of my mind and i'm not gonna talk about it that kind of laugh yes and the funny thing is that the same because we actually had gone we have like a common lot where they have like activities and this is um they were having some kind of fall activity and that's when we that's the day that we asked and um, I went and I, I was like done and me and the kids were like, we'll just go home. So my husband brought us home and he wanted to go back because, you know, the guys were drinking and um, he went back and he said that they were, I mean, only a few of the men stayed. So he was like, you know, they were kind of just, you know, talking and having a couple of beers when they heard like tree, like, like branches. <laughs> so like something was walking. <laughs> And what our neighbor, the one that believes that they're here, my husband said, he, he was like done. He was like, all right, I'll see you guys later. And he went home. He, he was gone. So he stayed with another, I think it was only him and another late uh, neighbor that were left behind. And my husband, because my husband, again, he did at the time, I mean, I know that he believed what I said. But I don't think he, it really sunk in because he was like, yeah, I kept, we kept hearing these things. But, you know, I guess they were just coming beers and they didn't like they were just there talking. And I'm thinking they probably wanted them to leave. <laughs> and they were trying to kind of say, hey, but they stayed. And I mean, the other guy didn't say anything. He just kind of stayed there and kept drinking. And you know that boils down to some people's philosophy. Like Carrie, he, Carrie's interview last night, he went into that. Like if the context mm -hmm. of your mind has not wrapped around the fact that, that something like that is possible to exist, mm -hmm. then you justify it away. You can be standing out there around the fire with your friends drinking beers, and you hear something, you say, oh, that's nothing, I'm not going to worry about it. And there's, there's a mm -hmm. little bit of protection in ignorance because you're ignorant to it and you just don't worry yes. about it, you know? Um, and, I, I, and I think my husband was at that point like in the beginning because he was trying to tell me you know I think he was worried that I was going to be like we're moving we're getting out of here I don't want to be here 
because he kept playing, you know, there's, you know, there's nothing. It's probably because, you know, I kept saying, I see them, like I've, I've taken pictures. And he was like, well, if you look at something, it's almost like looking up at the clouds. Some people can see faces in anything. And that's what he was telling me. But I'm like, no, I can see there's faces there. But that's, he just kind of dismissed it. And now, I mean, things have changed. Like he knows that they are out there now. Yeah, and what you're talking about is somebody rationalizing it. Let me ask you a couple of more questions about that neighborhood. How's the turnover mm -hmm. in that neighborhood? Are your neighbors still the same neighbors? Are you seeing people move in and out rapidly? Are you are houses going up for sale, coming off for sale, then going back up for sale? Or is it relatively stable in the neighborhood? The how the families are the families that's been there for let's say the past four or five years? Well, uh, when we first moved here, um, there were not many new new people. Uh, we were considered one of the younger families. Um, the ones that had been here had been here since the beginning. Um, it used to be an apple orchard, and whenever they subdivided it, and you know they started selling at the lots, we had quite a number of neighbors that bought in. And they had been here. They some neighbors have been here for like thirty years. Um, recently, we have started to see new neighbors because um, a lot of the lots were not. Um, they were not. I guess they were sold, but the people who owned them they didn't build anything. So a lot there. There's a lot of new construction going on. So a lot of the lots have new owners now and they're building houses. Um, we have had some, so it, it is a little bit more activity now, um, but, and that has been probably in the last year or two, but there's still a lot of older, like people that have been here for quite some time. Well, you said something real significant, I man, it, it really stands out. So the houses are built on an apple orchard, which is a food mm -hmm. source and a favorite Bigfoot food source. And so here we come, us humans decide, hey, we're going to build houses on this old apple yeah. orchard. And they're like, oh, really? Really, bro? So you're just going to tear down my trees and take mm -hmm. my food and you're going to put houses here. And um, that's, that's man, when you start putting the pieces to the puzzle together on this one, it's really lining up between the evidence of the photos, the eyewitness evidence, and then the historical background of the area it's starting to line up like it's definitely definitely some bigfoot or maybe something else there but it's something there and it's lining up mm -hmm. perfectly for it to make sense that something would be there that's uh that's 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 kind of terrifying have you guys had anything like any encounters in the house or at the house that kind of crossed the line like something that you were like you and your husband were like no see this is going too far have you ran into anything like that no um I ha I have not, and I've had a, a friend that said that they have come into her home. Um, I have not, but wait, 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 what? Into her home in your neighborhood? Oh no, no, this is. Oh. Um, I think you know her, Claudia. <laughs> oh yeah, she's, I know Claudia. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. She's mentioned that you know that they've come into her home. No, not in my neighborhood. I um, I've just because I've had a lot of things with me personally before I even moved here where there were things that I had dreams and just sleep paralysis. So what I've done is I pray, I pray and I've asked um, if it, it is from God, then I'm okay. Let God, you know, it is welcome at my home. If it is not from God then I do not accept any, I, I want, you know, I've asked God to keep it out of my home. So I have not had anything like that. I would feel like it's inside my house. Like, About like the only outside thing the is, house doing kind of, something. Beating on the walls yeah, or anything um, like that? Um, I really haven't had that either. I know that they peek in the windows just because I've taken pictures of them looking in. And I have seen them looking in. Um. They do tap, um, not every, not, not constantly. Every now and then, they'll make a noise outside. Um, if it, if I'm by myself, like in a room, um, in an area, they'll let me know. Like they'll make a sound outside, 
it's almost like they're letting me know, hey, I'm here. Um, or like if we're in, you know, in bed with my husband, we have heard taps, but it's not something that um, is bangs, like uh, it's just like a tap or, you know, we'll hear something get thrown uh, like a little pebble or something, but like one, one pebble and that's it. It doesn't happen often. Um, so I think I'm, I'm lucky when it comes to that because we don't have that where they're constantly, you know, traumatizing me or anything. It's just every now and then. Yeah. I've spoken to people where they're just constantly digging at them, aggravating them, tapping on windows beating on it's really people say beating on the walls but they don't really beat they slap on the walls of the house it's like a gigantic pie house like a hand slaps on the wall um it's not really a fist ball beating right and i have had um i I heard a slap um one night you know we were all ready for bed i was the last one up and i'm turning the lights off and i'm walking into the bedroom and then where our bathroom is our master bathroom I heard a slap and my dog was already laying down and she jumped up and she was barking and barking. Um, that was the only time that I heard a slap. And this probably happened like 2016. Um, it was the only time. Um, again, the other times had been just like a little tap. It hasn't been like, like I said, I've heard, in, you know, stories where people are like so terrified because it's like constant banging. It's nothing like that. Um, it's almost to let me know, Hey, I'm here, but it's, it doesn't happen often. No, there's, there's definitely people who encounter that where it's like, it's letting them know it's around and it's like, Hey, I'm mm-hmm. here. Don't freak out. I'm around. Yeah. If you bump into me. Don't trip. I'm here. And then they go on about their business. So what about the fruit yes. in the garden? Have you noticed any food missing from the garden? Yes. You know, and I, I have a lot of, <laughs> vegetables and fruit and and um we have fruit trees the only thing that we don't have missing i have two cherry trees in the front and we planted them probably two or three years ago and i've only gotten a handful of cherries out of and and i know they have a lot of flowers and i see the but that could be birds that could be birds taking the cherries or just otherwise you know squirrels so it could be anything but that's the only thing that has been taken. Um, deer do try to get our peaches um, in the garden. I don't see anything missing. We always have a, an abundance of things where I have to give stuff away. Wow. Um, okay. So they don't, they don't touch. I mean, I know that they go in the garden because I have found footprints in the garden. And I found bones, which is like the craziest thing that there are bones like in the garden, uh, other animal bones, like whether it be like deer ribs, um, vertebrae. <laughs> yeah. Like they just, just sitting weird. there munching on a bone watching you or is it just like old bones? I guess. Like, is there well, still meat on the bone? Like they're old. No, no, no. Well, oh, okay. I have found, uh, not in the garden, the garden, it looks like old bones, but I'm thinking they just appear. So, I mean, how did they get there? Now, I have found, like, just um, with it still having kind of meat um, throughout the property. But we have coyotes. We have foxes. So it could be other things. Um, I, I don't know about the bigger animals. Like, we have found. I found the hide of a deer. Uh, basically, it looked like the back end. But it was only like the leather and the fur. And it was left on like a, we have a gravel road that goes through our woods. It was left right there in the middle of the gravel road. So, I mean, I don't know what kind of animal would just leave the, it almost looks, it looked like leather. And then the fur of a deer. And it was a big piece. It was just left there. Also, I have found like the head uh, just the head of a deer uh, on the front of Mm-mm. our property. Mm-mm. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's that crazy. I don't like to come across. 
it, it, how was it just laid on the ground? Where was it? Yeah, I'm just the head of the deer was just laid on the ground. Um, it was just there. Uh, I found uh, the like the legs of like it. Lo- it almost looked like the little ones. It was just little legs of like the little fawns. It was almost like tossed um, on our property, like on the grass. Um, also, like on our road, basically just um, our, on our street, right in front of our property. They, it, like, it was just almost like a leg. And this one looked like a large size leg from like a deer. It just almost like they kind of just dropped it there on the middle of the road. Man, so I, I now yeah, understand I why know. he didn't want a camera. If I man, I wouldn't want to. If I had that kind of activity, I honestly would yeah. say I don't. I don't think I want to come to terms with this. The fear of actually seeing something drop a deer head, like literally walk by and just drop a deer head. Man, once that image is in your mind, you can't go outside yeah. anymore. So no, I understand where he like. You just can't go outside anymore because you know. You know, oh my God! I, I understand yeah, exactly. exactly where the man was. I understand, I understand exactly where he was. You just because he you likes to be outside. Yeah, yeah, and I think, and he doesn't even now. Like I know my family said, "Oh, you should put those, you know, doorbell cameras." And we actually we have one trail camera, and then we kind of move it around and place it different areas. But I think, and I know he did mention that we we were going to put some like on our deck. But we haven't done it yet. It's been, I don't know, it's been a year since he said we were going to put one on out there. But I think it is. I think it's one of those things where like, uh, I think that if you see it, you're, we're not going to want to be out there. No, I'm I mean, sure. I don't know. I see it. and Yeah. Yeah. But Wendy, for example, Wendy, like you get, you get the photos, you know, you had that. But once you start getting like the stuff we were capturing on Vault's property where we saw that thing walk up, it was yeah. blinking his eyes. Like, come on, man. Like, you if you know that's there and you got it on video and you have to face that, yeah, it, it changes everything. I understand. You know, and he, he wants to, and you guys, not he, you guys want to enjoy that property. And so far, they haven't yeah. done anything. So it's kind of like, why aggravate no, they, them? Right, right. And, and that's the thing. Like, they have, and I know my dad, because at the beginning, I was, like, terrified. I was so scared. And you, um, I contacted you first when I started, you know, taking videos of my windows uh when i when i first found the first face on there you were the first one i contacted because i was so scared and you reassured me i was okay and i was like okay okay that made made me feel a lot better and then i showed it to my family and then you know my dad also said you know if they wanted to hurt you they they would come in um and you know take you or if you walk outside, like, you know, they would definitely harm you, but they haven't done that. So, you know, it made me feel a lot better. Yeah, Just I mean, it's clear that, that they don't want to, they could have hurt either one of y'all at, the, at any point in time. Yes. So it's clear they yeah. don't want to hurt you. What they're doing, why they're doing it is the issue. Um, and truthfully, yeah. if I got a big giant monster outside and he ain't really trying to hurt me, and I can't mm-hmm. run them off, so guess what, bro? Me and you're going to have to right. come to an agreement. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> you're going to be peeking in on me. I'm yeah. going to be walking through the woods. We're going to have to have some kind of agreement, big dog. And I got to go where I got to go, and you got to go where you got to go. So, I mean, yeah. you got to learn to live with it. Or the only other option is to move. And I'm pretty sure you guys love that place. Mm-hmm. And you yeah, don't we, we've move. worked very hard. Yeah, we've worked very hard to kind of keep our areas um, nice and and, you know, now we're trying to grow, um, a, you know, food and everything. So it's one of those things where we're already established here. And um, I know my husband basically says, you know, if they want to have the property at night, then so be it. It's almost like he basically said, it's going to be one of those things where you live and let live. So let them be out there as long as they don't bother us or do anything, you know, basically, I guess, um, you know, break anything, or if they don't, you know, start being a menace, then they're fine. Let them run around and hide and, you know, be in the trees and just let them be out there. No, I think that's a smart way to look at it. And then I'm thinking, you know, if the neighborhood is constantly being developed, the more people get there, 
they're going to be forced to start doing some things differently because the more people in the neighborhood, the more people living around, the more people they have to interact with, and more particularly, mm-hmm. the more people they have to watch instead of watching you all the time. So they can go over and watch somebody right. else. Because it seems like you guys are entertainment for them, except for when you get in their way when they're doing something, and then they're like, okay, we need you to get out of here. You know what I'm saying? So it seems mm-hmm. like they're just mm-hmm. chilling, watching y'all, similar to what you're doing, snapping pictures and watching them. I really wish... We had we had some kind of conclusive um, decision being made on what they were. I know I've talked to a lot of cryptozoologists, yeah. and they've said um, what they thought they were. I've talked to people who said they're demons. I talked to people who said you know they're aliens, and there's a mm-hmm. case for all of that. Um, and the only reason why I don't want to know exactly what they are, like you know, uh, Kerry Arnold has a good made a good case for they're actually humans, uh, mm-hmm. feral humans. It, it, the, I think the most important thing is how in the world do we communicate to them? Hey, bro, you're making me uncomfortable because they can clearly communicate to us when we're making yeah. them uncomfortable. You know? Yes. Now, and I think um, in the beginning, again, this happened back in 2016, where I was, you know, kind of going outside to see if I could hear anything, and I was standing on the porch, and then I had. Um, it almost sounded like one of them was like in our wood line and it was sniffing and it was sniffing like so loud that I actually, it hurt, like my stomach got upset just to knowing that there's something out there sniffing. Uh, and it sounded like it was sniffing me from the wood line. So I, um, I came in just cause I couldn't, you know, my stomach got all upset and I had to go use the bathroom And then the next day, I basically went out there and said, you know, do not scare me. And I said it out loud. And when I'm outside, like if if I'm, you know, by myself, I'll just say out loud, do not scare me. And for some reason, I guess maybe they understand because they, you know, they're quiet. (laughs) Like ever since then, like I, I didn't until now that we heard with my husband. Um you know, when they were breaking branches and then we heard something galloping towards us. Um, Those were two incidents, but other than that, they're very quiet. So I do think they do understand. I'm pretty sure they do understand because I've talked to so many witnesses that have communicated, hey man, stop, Mm -hmm. and they will stop. Or, hey, you're making me uncomfortable. Or especially like, uh, just recently I talked to a gentleman and he went to his uncle's house. His uncle was a drunk and had all these different problems, but his uncle has had Bigfoot on this property, on their family property, since they were children, right? And so he goes Mm -hmm. to stay with his uncle. He doesn't know that he's not supposed to burn the trash at night. He goes out there to burn the trash, sets a pile of trash on fire, and he said, man, it sounded like a zoo out there when I did it. I ran back inside. He said, my uncle came outside with a shotgun and walked out and said, hey, um, this is my nephew. He doesn't know any better. Leave him alone. They kept on making noises, so he shot the shotgun in the air. And he said, man, it was like he got their attention with the shotgun. And he said, hey, leave my nephew alone. He doesn't know any better. We're going to make this right. And then the next morning, he made that boy go with him to the market, buy five bags of apples, and drop oh, apples wow. on their tree line. So I was like, bro, what did you do? He said, man, I just cut the bags open and dropped all the apples. And he said, we left for 15 minutes and came back. He was like, dude, it was 50 apples gone. And he said, after that, wow. he could go outside at any point in time at night. He would hear them, but they wouldn't make any noise. He could do whatever he wanted to do, but it wasn't a problem. Mm-hmm. So I think they clearly do understand what we're saying yeah. because they've been around listening to us forever. Right. And, and, I, and I do think that because, like I said, I know I've said it and they don't make any noise. Like if I'm out there, I mean, I know that they're there. Like, and I have seen them uh, with a naked eye. Um, so I know they're there, but they haven't done anything, you know, to scare me. And I, it is kind of scary seeing them. Like the little ones, I'm okay. I can see them and I'm fine. The bigger ones are kind of scary. <laughs> so those, once I see the bigger ones, I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm going in and I'm done for the day. No, just because no. they're huge they're huge yeah. they are huge like those faces we yeah. were capturing on those cameras were massive yes massive yes. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, massively intimidated. Oh man, look, it's it's going on an hour, Wendy. Let's do this before we run out of time. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody where they can find you. I don't know if you have a Facebook, if you got a Twitter, if you got an Instagram, I but do, tell everybody where they I can find you. I do not. I do have a Facebook, but I don't put anything um, that you know. This is only like my YouTube. <laughs> All I have is YouTube at the moment. Um, everything else, like I don't, you know, I still have people around me that they're. You know, I don't know if I want them to know what's going on. Right. So I only have YouTube and that's like my little outlet. <laughs> um, that's about the only thing. And then I have a private group with, you know, just family. And Sean is in there. Um, but that's, you know, just like a small where I can just kind of put up, you know, if anything happens like today, I'm like, I'll put it on there. Uh, but it's YouTube would be the only thing that I have at the moment. And right, it's so, turquoise and Sasquatch. All right. So it's turquoise and Sasquatch. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're here on YouTube, because I'm releasing this whole thing on YouTube and you mm -hmm. like what you've heard. And honestly, if you want to follow someone who gets real evidence, I'm not talking about like blurry pictures. I'm talking about somebody who has real evidence that has an eye for this, a proven eye. It's not like, oh, I think I can see him. No, we know she can see him. Um, she's been on Sasquatch Chronicles. She's been all over the place talking about Bigfoot and the photographs she's found. And in, in, in the near future, if I can help her, she's going to be a lot of other places um, talking about it as well. You need to go ahead and subscribe to Wendy's channel. Head on over. I'm going to put the link in the description. You guys head over, become subscribers. Help her grow. Hit the thousand mark and go beyond. Because it's one thing that we need to do. Um, we highlight a lot of personalities in this field. And a lot of my male personalities. And that's cool. Because those guys are out in the woods, but we got to give the sisters some love in this as well because they have certain talents and gifts that um, they need to be highlighted. And I'm going through the process of highlighting women who actually are real investigators. So show her some love on my behalf if you're a member of the Dark Waters family. And if you're a stranger and you just wandered in here and you're listening and trying to figure out what's going on, trust me, just go ahead and do it. And, and don't be a jerk. Do it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the one and only Dog Waters. We're wrapping this up. I'm going to have Wendy back again in a different capacity to talk about some other things. Um, this was a fast hour because we started talking about encounters. But there were a couple other things we had on the table that we didn't get to. But that's fine. Um, time is on our side. We can talk about it later. This is Dog Waters. I'm out of here. Listen, after what me and my brother experienced, this was my last time going elk hunting. I never ever was able to actually adjust to being in the woods again. But let me take you back to the beginning. My brother and I have been hunting since we were nine years old. Got turned on to elk hunting in our early 20s. And for his 35th birthday, we decided to go to New Mexico on an elk hunting expedition. And listen, when I tell you the events of this trip, I will absolutely never forget I won't because it changed the way I see the world entirely now this expedition cost us eight thousand dollars and it gave us access to private land in fact 3,500 acres of private land in New Mexico the way it worked was you hop on a plane rent a car head to the area and they take you out, drop you off in the woods for three days, leaving you with a GPS phone and a GPS tracker. If you needed to leave for any reason, you were supposed to call them using that GPS phone and they guaranteed that they would be there within an hour to extract you no matter what, <clears throat> no matter what time, day or night. Look, this is how I went down. We got to the location about 9, 10 o'clock that morning, had a little bit to eat, went through all of their emergency training, and then... They took us out and dropped us off in the middle. I mean, the middle of nowhere at 3 p.m. Imagine me and my brother are hurrying, trying to get our tent set up, knowing that sundown is headed our way. That night, we sleep in the tents, get up early in the morning, 
and head out to start hunting. So that next morning by 9 a.m. it's full light outside. My brother and I are set up in this thick trees and brush and we start sending out calls trying to catch the attention of a bull elk. The way it was going was simple. He makes the first call, we wait 10 minutes. Then he makes a second call and we wait 10 minutes. Now, it was on his third call when he made this super aggressive challenge bugle that must have gotten this thing's attention. Because I see this giant black figure hauling tail down the side of this ridge. Look, at first I'm thinking it's an elk based on the sheer size of it. Then I decided to look through my scope. And listen, that's when I realized it wasn't an elk. So now I'm thinking to myself, man, maybe this is a bear. Maybe we done called in a bear and it's running down on us. But I take another closer look. Now my brother makes another aggressive call. Mind you, I'm still there looking through the scope, trying to identify this thing when it stops running and stands up on two legs. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you were seeing something, but you weren't quite sure if you were exactly seeing what you thought you saw? That's the situation that I was in. I take my eyes out of that scope and then look back in. And this thing is standing on two legs. He blows another call and I'm like, Teddy, whatever you do, stop, please, please stop blowing those calls. Looking back through the scope, I tell you this thing is look in our direction. Now, I'm not saying it was looking at me through the scope because I don't believe it could do that. But I'm telling you, it was looking directly at us. Next thing you know, it drops down on all fours and it comes further down that ridge. When it comes off of that ridge, it goes into this gigantic clump of trees, and we lose it. Listen, for those of you who know absolutely nothing about elk hunting, understand, a full-grown bull elk can be 12 to 1,300 pounds. This thing on all fours was the size of a full-grown bull elk. No doubt about it, hands down, it was absolutely terrifying. And I need you to understand the dynamic. My brother Teddy is cool, calm, and collective because he didn't get a chance to see this thing through the scope. But me, I'm sitting there freaking all the way out because I observed this thing's ungodly speed as it was coming down that ridge. And based on the speed that I saw it running, it should have been coming out of that tree line at any moment. So I have my rifle at the ready, thinking to myself, man, I am going to have to shoot this. I tell Teddy, Teddy, please pick up your rifle this thing is running down on us. Listen, I love my brother to death. Wouldn't trade him for anyone in the world. But he did not believe me. So I literally pick his rifle up and put it in his hand and say, Teddy, hold on to this. This thing is coming in on us. We sit there quietly for 25 minutes and nothing comes out of those woods. And that's when this mini argument breaks out between me and my brother. Him saying, bro, we spent a lot of money to come out here to hunt these elks. I don't need you freaking out because of something you think you saw through the scope. And I'm telling him, brother, I did not think I saw it. I know I saw it. And we come to this decision that it's probably best for us to pack up and move camp. So we pack up our entire camp and walk six miles away from the location that we're in and go through the process of resetting up our camp. We get everything done right before nightfall. Our plan is to go straight to sleep, get up early in the morning, and then start hunting again. But oh boy, when I tell you things didn't go as planned, they did not go as planned at all. Because the two of us are out there sitting around the fire. We had just cooked a little food, we're getting ready to go into our tents, and we start to hear these wolves howling in the distance. Not one wolf, not two wolves, it had to be at least six to eight wolves howling in the distance. They sound like they're a solid mile away. Then 10 minutes later, they howl again, and they sound like they're hundreds of yards away. Then five minutes later, they howl again, and they sound like they're 30 to 50 yards away. Amongst all of this howling, there is this other growling, barking howl so loud that it shuts them all up. And then the next thing you know, two of those wolves come into our camp. And understand, I've been hunting my entire life, and this is not typical behavior from wolves. We got a gigantic fire going. Now, they will circle you around that fire and growl, but they don't come straight in at you, single file line, 
Two wolves come into our camp, single file, lying, growling like they want to rip our heads off. Teddy is scrambling to get both of the rifles. He throws me my rifle as these two wolves who came in separate, one looking at him and one looking at me. And that's when I hear something behind us. And looking behind us, there is a third wolf closing in. And right here in this moment is when things go off the chain. Because I wasn't taking any chances. I shoot the first two wolves right there in front of me. And Teddy shoots and kills the one behind us. When that happens, you hear what sounds like the other wolves that were with them scampering away into the darkness. But then there is a growl. I'm talking about a vicious, long, mean growl. And you hear those wolves coming back in our direction. And another two wolves come out of the woods from different directions. So we shoot them. Then again, you hear the rest of the wolves scampering and running away. And about three to five minutes later, something out there starts to kill those wolves. Hands down, no doubt about it, you hear the snarling, the growling, the yelping. Something starts killing those woods, and then everything goes silent. So imagine a scene, my brother and I are now sitting in chairs, back to back, right next to the fire, adrenaline pumping, heart beating, trying to figure out what in the world is going on. And we hear something circling us. This is not a wolf. It's not on four legs. It is on two legs. And it is circling us fast like water going down a drain. The circles that it's making are getting closer and closer and closer and closer to us. And then I get a glimpse of this thing by the firelight. And it is a giant freaking black wolf standing on two legs and its head is bigger than my entire upper body i tell teddy listen bro listen bro if this thing comes out of these woods we are going to shoot and we will not stop shooting until it is dead then teddy gets a glimpse of it by his flashlight and completely freaks all the way out i'm talking about shaking shivering stuttering his words terrified by what he sees it provokes so much fear in us that he starts to take pot shots, wasting ammunition. I tell him, Teddy, I want you to calm down because I think this thing is trying to get us to run out of ammunition. You are shooting at it. This goes on the entire night. It's circling us, bluff charging us, trying to get one of us to run and separate it the entire night until the sun comes up. I need you to understand that is from 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 30 in the morning. This thing harassed the two of us trying to get us to split up, trying to get us to make a mistake. And I'll tell you, anybody else who had no experience in the woods would have got up and ran. The only reason why my brother and I are alive today is because we have been hunting since we are nine years old and we know predatory behavior. Imagine a scene. The sun is up. We have dead wolves laying on the ground all around us. Blood spilled everywhere. Flies are everywhere. And we go out into the woods just to look around and see what the hell was going on. And that's when we discover the other wolves with their heads ripped off, legs ripped off, giant bite marks in them, tails ripped off completely i mean ripped off listen teddy says bro nobody's gonna believe this i'm gonna take pictures of these wolves on my cell phone so he starts taking pictures while i get on that sad phone and call for a pickup we have to sit there for an hour and a half before these guys drive all the way out to our location and pick us up the minute we get inside the vehicle the minute they get to our camp they look around we start telling them what happened these guys start freaking out. They start helping us pack our stuff and they say, look, we have to go. We have to go right now. Teddy and I are trying to get answers from them. They are not answering questions. Listen, we get all the way back to what they consider their base camp. We're standing there talking to them, showing them pictures of what happened to these wolves. And the guy says, hey, man, delete all those pictures. That is bad for business. Delete the pictures. Now him and Teddy are fussing about the pictures in Teddy's phone. He offers us a full refund in exchange for deleting those pictures and not 
talking about it whatsoever. Understand the situation my brother and I were in. We spent this entire time being terrified. So we took that refund, deleted those pictures, and came back home. This is the craziest thing. Teddy, who's got to be insane, went back the following year with six of his other friends to hunt elks at the same location. They tried and tried and tried to talk me into doing it, but I told them hell to the no. No, after seeing that, I'm not going anywhere near New Mexico. And you shouldn't either, Teddy. But they went and didn't have a freaking problem in the world. As a father, I always thought that I would lay down my life for my family. But just like most other fathers, I never thought that there would come a situation where I felt like I was forced to do it. Then, I suddenly found myself in one very such situation and I would like to tell you about it. Now, if you're married with kids, you know how it is when mom goes away out of town. And for me and my sons, when mom is gone, all hell breaks loose because we do whatever we want to do. So my wife goes out of town on a business trip. So, and I decided to take my sons out for a day at the lake and camping at Little Black Creek in Mississippi. We get there. The kids are out there having fun. It's families everywhere talking about grilling hamburgers and hot dogs, fishing, running around, splashing in the water. We have a freaking ball. As it gets closer and closer to sundown, I prepare the tent. Other fire, other families join us around this fire. We have some beers. We're laughing. The kids are playing, running back and forth in the darkness. I'm talking about one hell of a time while mom is gone away. After a couple of hours of that, it gets to be about 8.30, 8.45. Everybody decides they're going to head to bed. So me and my sons climb in our tent and we're laying there. They have their headphones on, connected to their tablets, watching cartoons. I'm just laying on my back, looking up at the top of the tent, thinking about how wonderful and joyous this day has been, saying to myself, it would be nice if my wife was here so she could experience this. I lay there for like another 15, 20 minutes, and then this weird feeling comes over me, almost as if something is watching the tent. Then I start to hear movement, footsteps outside around the area. And at first, I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's probably one of the other families. They left something, they came back over to get it, and they're going to go away, right? Uh-uh, nope, 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 no, sir, no, ma'am. Next thing you know, I hear this breathing right there next to my face on the other side of that vinyl tent. And then this low growling sound. That audible growl can be tracked as it moves up into the air, and now I can tell the growling is coming from above the tent. That's when this fear washes over me. And what I mean washes over me, it's almost as if my body was laying right at the edge of the water on the beach and waves of fear were hitting my feet, coming up my legs, hitting my waist, and submerging me all the way up to my neck and then going back down and then back up and then back down. I have never felt that kind of fear in my life. I'm laying there thinking to myself, what in the world is this? And this little bitty voice in the back of my head says, you need to get up and you need to go outside and confront it. Listen to me, I'm not sure if you ever had that little voice that speaks to you in the back of your head. It's just this small, still, quiet voice. It's not screaming, it's not hollering. It's just small and still. And it says it three times. You need to get up and go outside and confront it. The third time it says it, it's a little bit more aggravated. It says, listen, get up, go outside and confront that. But I'm so bogged down in this fear, my body it literally feels like it's strapped down to the ground. But I make the decision to get up. So now I'm getting up, unzipping the tent, go outside. And when I look back at the direction of the tent, there is this humanoid wolf looking thing. It looks more human than wolf. 
and it has these glowing red eyes with black pupils. And when I say glowing red eyes, I mean take your hand, ball it up, make a fist. That portion of your hand where your thumb wraps around and it makes that circle, that's how big these eyes are. They are glowing red with gigantic black pupils. And it's just there, staring at the tent, not paying any attention to me. And the voice again says, you need to confront it. And I say, hey, I have no clue what you are, but what are you doing? And it ignores me. I mean, flat out ignores me. It's fixing, it is fixated on that tent. Then the voice in my head again says, this is evil and evil loves to target children. You need to get its attention and you need to confront it. So I say, hey, this time with more conviction, I say, hey, leave my children alone. Boy, listen, when I tell you that thing whips its head in my direction and stares at me looking straight into my soul and it charges me. It's on the opposite side of the tent. It charges me through the tent. The only thing that came in my direction was its upper body. I didn't see any legs. I didn't see anything. It charges me. And as it's charging, it begins to dissipate, leaving only these glowing red eyes there for a split second. Listen, by the time it's all over, I feel physically drained. That's how much fear I had inside of me. I look left, I look right, I look up, I look down, I look behind me looking for this thing. It's nowhere to be found. So I crawl back into the tent and lay down. And now my two sons are laying there peacefully asleep. Man, I was in fear. Listen to me when I tell you I was in fear for a solid four hours. And then this peace came over me and I went to sleep. The following morning, we wake up. I'm fixing breakfast. And I look around and I notice all those families that were there when we went to bed. We're the only ones left at Little Black Creek in the camping area. Everybody's gone. I don't profess to know exactly what it was. And I'm not even saying to you that it ran those family members off. I don't know what happened. All I'm telling you is what I experienced and what I experienced was absolutely terrifying. Man, I'm ashamed to even mention how I ended up in this situation all alone, dazed and confused. What made it worse was I saw two of these things, man. But let me take you back to how it all started. It was my friend Willis. Yes, a white boy named Willis who came over to my house blowing his horn at 9 p.m. to pick me up. Willis, who liked to be called Will for short because people constantly made fun of him, was God's gift to mechanics. The kind of person who grew up with a wrench in his hand and could fix anything, a lawnmower, a motorbike, a car, you name it, he just knew how to fix it. So when it came down to cars, they were his first love. And he was a true speed demon behind the wheel. So when he got his hands on a 1967 classic Chevy Corvette, just for pennies on the dollar and started working on it, I already knew he was gonna be a monster on the highway. That night, he picks me up in that Corvette and he's done put all kind of money under the hood and into the suspension of this car. But the seats are still crappy and the paint job looked like something from a zombie apocalypse movie. But let me tell you, when this boy hit the gas, man felt like you were flying on a rocket ship. Next thing I know, the two of us are speeding down the highway, headed to where everyone meets to race. Will is out of his body with excitement because he has a race set up for five thousand dollars. I'm sitting in the passenger seat looking at him saying bro could you please slow down you're driving way way too freaking fast. Take it easy if you keep driving like this we're not even gonna make it to the race. 
10 minutes later we pull up to the spot there are people everywhere outside it's a party races are going down he is sitting there waiting on the guy that he's supposed to race in the meantime i run into this girl named kimberly now hold on hold on let me explain something to you about kimberly kimberly was half white half asian but she was just the right amount of asian to make her look exotic imagine the scene she's got on a crop top short shorts long fine thick legs with wedge shoes on that make her look like she's six foot four i am hitting on her we start having drinks having a wonderful time next thing you know the two of us end up in the back of my partner brian's van now let me tell you a little bit about brian brian had been rolling with us since we were kids and brian was a speedster as well but he had taken all of his money and dumped it into this van i'm telling you man this thing was a hotel on wheels but it was fast so now brian and will are off trying to get this race squared away waiting on the guy to come and me and kelly are in the back of his van getting it on i'm getting sloppy drunk she's getting sloppy drunk it's going down i'm about to be knee deep in the shepherd's daughter when the police pull up and i ain't talking about one cop car two cop cars we talk about 12 13 police cars show up the two of us are in the back of the van half naked i see the lights hear the siren she jumps out of the back of the van and starts running while she's pulling her pants up i hop into the front seat and start to pull off understand movies mimic real life and real life sometimes mimics movies but i'm saying to you if you've ever seen a movie scene where there are a bunch of kids out there racing cars and the police pull up and everybody skirts off trying to get away from the police that is real the one rule we have as racers is that when the cops come we flee we do not stop and let them arrest us no 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 matter what you are doing your job is to flee so now i'm behind the wheel of brian's van peeling out and this thing is an oversized rocket ship I'm trying to position myself between all of the rest of the cars to get back to the main street but a cop car cuts me off forcing me to go down this dirt road now pause right here in the story i've been down this road before i knew exactly where it took me to so i am flying down this dirt road doing no less than 85 miles an hour it's bumpy and i'm moving looking through the rear view mirror that cop car who had cut me off looks as if it's turning to go in a different direction and chase after someone else but i'm not taking any chances up ahead in this road is a curve and as you come out of that curve you come up to another paved roadway if i can get on that road and make a right and hit the gas within three miles i will be on the interstate and i'm telling you there is nothing that the police can do mind you i have been drinking i'm not gonna lie to you i'm drunk i'm coming around that curve and listen dude i see the distance in height between the dirt road and the paved road and in my mind i'm taking my foot off the gas and hitting the brake so i can hit that roadway come on top slam on the brakes cut the wheel spin and go but no 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 i was drunk and so instead of hitting the brakes i hit the gas next thing you know i'm flying through the air over the road and into the trees on the other side this van is laying on its side with the driver's side door up in the air there is a gigantic log that has penetrated the windshield with no condom i'm dazed half in and half out coming to the understanding that i'm bleeding from my head now pause right here in the story and let me say this to you i'm only sharing with you what i remember i am not coming to any conclusions i am not sure if what i experienced was something spiritual because i was halfway dead or if what i experienced was something physical so i'm just sharing with you what happened you decide you help me because i have no freaking clue but here's what i know had happened i am there suspended laying sideways in that van bleeding out of my head i can feel pain in my arms pain in my neck pain in my back and that log which had penetrated the front windshield gets yanked out of the windshield and when i say yanked it was almost as if someone had pulled a toothpick out of a stake the next thing i know i'm going unconscious again and when i wake back up there is no windshield in front of me and what i am looking at looks like a freaking werewolf we are face to face this thing is down on all fours its head is inside of the van sniffing me man sniffing me next thing i know something or someone still not sure snatches it grabs it and pulls it back pissing this thing off so much so that it bumps its head on the way back out 
of the vehicle, I hear it growl and snarl, and then I pass back out again. Listen, I can't tell you how long I was out, but I come back to consciousness again. I see what looks like gigantic dog legs walking back and forth in front of that open space of the windshield. Again, I am in a van, it is turned on its side. These legs are big enough to fill up damn near the entire space from the dashboard to the ceiling. Next thing I know, I pass out again and when I come through, I am in the back of an ambulance handcuffed, headed to the hospital. Now when I get to the hospital, I wake back up again. I got stitches in my head. I'm handcuffed to the bed. There are police there talking to me and they're asking me questions about who else was in the vehicle with me. I tell them I was in the vehicle alone. I'm thinking to myself, bro, this is not my first rodeo. I'm not about to tell y'all nothing. But they insist that someone else had to be in the vehicle with me. So now I'm insisting that no one was there. They're telling me they have samples of my blood and my blood alcohol levels are high, which I didn't give them permission to draw my blood, but nonetheless, this is what they do. They're trying to leverage that against me for a DUI. And I'm like, whatever, bro, I'm not lying to you. Nobody was there. That's when one of the officers proceeds to explain to me that someone else had to have been there because the front windshield had been neatly taken out and laid next to a tree. Then, on top of that, the driver's side door had literally been wedged open and ripped off the vehicle and sat right next to that windshield. I'm telling him, sir, there was no one else in the vehicle with me. I don't know what's going on. I have no clue what the hell you are talking about. I ended up getting locked up for six months because that wasn't my first rodeo with the police and that damn show wasn't my first accident. Listen, while I'm inside, my cellmate, who has somehow smuggled a phone inside the prison, is talking about this dude named Dark Waters who was paying people in prison for their prison stories. So now we are sitting in our cell listening to a Dark Waters story about these dog men and I tell him, bro, I have seen something like that. So the first thing I did when I got out was reach out and tell this story. Not because I want attention, not because I want money, I haven't even received a dime. I'm just trying to figure out if what I saw was real or if I was half dead and there was some kind of demon coming for me and I haven't been able to figure it out. What do you think? My dog man encounter happened on my 19th birthday, which is why I could never forget these events. It was supposed to be a wonderful day. My parents were out of town in Hawaii, I had the house to myself, my girlfriend and I were going to go swimming in the pool, then hang out at home alone. Then it all went straight downhill. And while that day was rolling and sliding and grinding downhill, it got slammed and smashed against rocks and trees and ended up a twisted wreck of all my hopes and dreams. Imagine the scene. My parents leave the day before. So that night, I'm home alone, get some sleep, get up early. My plan is to ride into town, get some burgers, fries, soda, chips, you know, snacks for the two of us. While simultan well, simultaneously while I'm doing that, my girlfriend is supposed to be waking up early to bake me a birthday cake. The plan was for me to head on over to her house at 12 noon, pick her up, and then we head back over to my place. Now that you understand how the day was supposed to go, let me tell you exactly how it went. I'm out of the door at 9.30 a.m., headed to the store. I'm driving in my dad's truck, get to the store, park it away from every other car because my dad is a fanatic about his truck. Go into the store, get my stuff, come back out. There was a scratch on this man's pickup truck that goes from the front driver's side wheel well all the way to the freaking driver's side door. This is not a normal scratch. This is almost as if someone took a basket and rubbed it against my dad's vehicle on purpose. 
Imagine a scene, I'm standing there in the parking lot with those plastic bags in my hand, looking at this scratch saying, holy crap, if my father sees this, he is going to flip out and blow his wig. So now I'm inside the vehicle, sitting there calling the insurance agent, telling him what happened, and the insurance agent explains to me that my father has a $250 deductible, so it will only cost me $250 to get this scratch fixed. I go on to explain to him that my dad is out of town, I was driving his vehicle, I have $250 but this scratch needs to be repaired within the next 5 days. He clicks over, calls one of his friends who owns a body shop, tells that guy that I need to have this done immediately and they go about making the arrangements for me to take that truck over to them this very same day. Now my mind the problem solved, I just got to figure out how I'm going to get his truck over there and get a ride back. But nonetheless, my girlfriend Emma is supposed to be with me in a few hours, so I'm thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to head back home, take these groceries, put them in the refrigerator, go over to Emma's house, pick her up. Emma's going to drive my mom's car, I'm going to drive the truck, we're going to drop it off at the shop, come back, and have a fun day. Nope. Because when I go over to Emma's house and I knock on the front door, her parents are in the middle of having one of those arguments. I'm talking about one of those furniture moving arguments. You can hear it outside of the house. Imagine a scene, I'm ringing the doorbell, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, and I hear her dad screaming, that door swings open, and this man has rage in his eyes. Now pause right here in the story. I don't know if you ever been in a situation where you was dating the man's daughter. And then he comes to the door angry at his wife with rage in his eyes and you're the first thing that he sees. All I'm explaining to you is this. That is not a situation you want to be in. He comes storming out of the door, bumps my shoulder, walks outside, circles around the front of the house. Emma comes out of the front door holding the cake, smiling. And as she's coming through the threshold of the door, her mother comes barging out, bumping into her, knocking the cake out of her hand. It slams on the ground. Her mom is in hot pursuit of her dad. I'm watching the cake fall. Emma's eyes are instantly filling up with tears. The next thing I know she is screaming at her parents, calling them childish and immature because they are always arguing and can't get along and she tells them they are better off if they are divorced. Understand, my birthday cake that she just made is laying there flat on the ground outside of the house. The plate that it was on is broken on the ground. I'm thinking me and Emma need to pick this up and clean it up. But she doesn't care. She walks out to go get inside of the vehicle and says, come on, let's go. And so now the two of us are in my mom's car. I done already did enough damage to my dad's vehicle. I'm scared to even drive it. We drive away from my house, head up the road. She is screaming, angry, crying, going through all of these freaking emotions and having a meltdown. I understand the area that we live in is extremely rural and I want to comfort her. So I see this little dirt road that turns off into the woods right off the highway. So I, so I turn off the highway onto that dirt road, pull the vehicle to a stop, hop out, walk around the front side of the vehicle, open the door, pull her out of the car and hug her trying to get her to calm down. I'm standing there holding Emma. She's crying like a little baby saying she's so tired of the way her parents behave and that they get on her nerves and that she just wished that the two of them were divorced. I'm standing there holding her listening to this and my eyes catch a glimpse of movement in the woods. Again, so you'll understand everything that's going on. The driver's side door of my mother's car is open. The car is still running. The passenger side door of my mother's car is open. The two of us are standing in between the space between the open passenger side door her back is to the woods, I am facing the woods, I am looking over the hood of the car and into those woods and I see movement and then my eyes lock in on what looks like another set of eyes in the trees. Initially I'm like okay this has been a traumatic day, now you're in the woods and you're seeing things. Then those eyes look to the left and then look to the right then look back at me and I realize that these are real eyes. So now I'm focusing in trying to figure out what the hell this is and I start to make out the shape of a head, ears and a snout. And so now I'm thinking to myself, okay, this looks like a giant wolf head. That's what's going through my mind. This looks like a giant wolf head. She is crying and sobbing and wetting up my shirt. And then this thing does something that leaves absolutely no doubt. It pushes his head through the tree limbs and leaves and literally shows me its face. 
And when I tell you I see a long snout, I see the ripples on the snout, I see these yellow eyes with a black pupil, and these sharp pointy ears, and it's just looking at me. Our eyes are locked right then and there for a solid three seconds, and now I understand that there is something there looking at us. Understand this is a delicate situation, Emma is there having a meltdown, and I'm looking at a freaking werewolf. So I grab her by her shoulders, turn her body, slide her into the vehicle, close the door, and now I slowly. So now I'm walking around the front of the vehicle with my hands up in the air saying, listen, Wolfman, I don't know what the hell you are or where you came from, but I'm sorry if I interrupted whatever you're doing, but I'm leaving. I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. I keep saying I'm leaving, I'm leaving all the way until I get into the vehicle and put it in reverse and back out of there. Understand, I've backed the vehicle back out onto the road. I'm driving away and Emma is looking at me like I have lost my mind. But we spend the rest of that time riding in silence. I could not wrap my thoughts around what I just saw. And you add in all the rest of the drama for the day. It was absolutely too much for me. So we get to my parents' house. So we get to my parents' house, I hop in my dad's truck, drive it over to the repair shop, which just so happens to be 18 miles away, turn around, drive my mother's vehicle back to the house, and by the time I get home, man, I am wore out and tired. I done forgot it's my 19th birthday. In fact, I don't even care that it's my birthday. All I want to do is lay down and take a nap. And if it wasn't for Emma, I tell you, this would have been my worst birthday ever. But she took all the stuff that I had bought, cooked us burgers, made me go outside and hang out at the pool, eat the food, we listened to music and laughed and joked around. A couple of hours later, the two of us fall asleep watching TV on the sofa. We wake up the next morning, have some breakfast and chill. Now here's the messed up thing about the whole situation. Emma stayed with me for three straight days and up and her parents didn't call her looking for her or didn't even seem worried about her. Not once. Now as far as my dad's truck goes, it didn't get fixed in time. So I had to fess up and man up and tell him exactly what happened. I'm expecting this man to spaz out and lose it, but he doesn't seem mad at all. He just says, you paid the deductible? And I tell him, yes. It's in the shop and I tell him, yes. He says, okay, well, whenever it comes out, just let me know. Now talk about being surprised. He completely caught me aback with this one, but I think I know exactly what happened. You see him and my mom had an entire week to play house together. So I really think my dad was in a good mood. He didn't really give a damn about that truck. Met you in the winter when I was a mystery It was cold but I was full of fire And you said you like my wild eyes and strong mind You like sunshine, oh My midnight's a late youth and I belong to you And we're soaking in the full moons I fall for your laughter, you hold me together Got me feeling like a Listen man, when I was 12 years old I had one of the most cruel pranks played on me That I think could ever be done to a 12 year old little boy so, my friends up and down the street had all got to that age where they had girlfriends, right? You know, we used to be outside playing football, doing our thing. Then all of a sudden, everybody disappears. We're going on 12, 13, nobody's outside. And I'm not hip to this whole thing at all. I guess you can call me a little bit more immature than the rest of them. Or maybe I was just being raised right and I shouldn't have been messing with girls at 12, 13 years old. But nonetheless, instead of being outside playing football, everybody is chasing girls. I go outside, help the street, knock on the door, asking for this one, asking for that one. They're always gone. Finally, one of my friends comes to my house, knocks on the door to show off his beautiful. I mean, she's an absolutely beautiful girlfriend. Says, this is my girlfriend. We're going to hang out. Do you want to come with us? And I'm like, eh, no, nah, not really. This don't seem like a good situation. Nonetheless, the three of us hang out outside under a tree. Now, the kid that I'm sitting with is kind of like my arch nemesis. We'd have had 10 12 fights over the years I'm talking about fights since we were 6 years old And I'm thinking Okay you know maybe Just maybe you know he and I can get along And he tells me look 
You don't have no girlfriend. I'm going to set you up with this girl around the corner, right? So he says, here's her number. Give her a call. It's my girlfriend's friend. I go inside, call the number. This girl answers the phone. And I say, hey, Barry gave me your phone number. He was saying that you needed somebody to talk to. Um, maybe you and I can hang out sometime. I'm 12, 13 years old. I don't know what to say to the girl. I'm just talking, right? Well, she starts to talk to me. We start talking on the phone every day, spending hours and hours on the phone. But this girl is supposed to live right around the corner, right? So I tell her, I say, hey, I'm going to come around the corner and see you and hang out. And she's always like, no, I'm not home. No, I got somewhere to go. No, I got something to do. And it gets kind of weird to me because it's like, yo, live around the corner. How come I can't come see you? So finally, finally, I decide to ask her, hey, what street do you live on around the corner? I'm coming around now. She can't tell me the street. Now it's coming to my realization that something's not right about this situation. So I go to my friend Barry and I say, hey, man, you know that girl you hooked me up with? She says she lives around the corner, but I don't think she lives around the corner. He has this devilish smile on his face. And he says, man, I can get her to come around here. I can get her to come around here. Don't worry about it. I get her to come over when my girlfriend comes over Saturday. Well, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm kind of excited. It's summertime. This conversation happens on a Thursday. Friday comes around. I'm, man, super excited. I want to see this chick. I want to meet her. Saturday rolls around. I done told my mama. I done told my daddy. I done told everybody that this girl is coming to our neighborhood to meet me. And, bro, why he knocks on my front door, and when I open the door, it's him, his girlfriend, and a beach whale. Listen to me. When I say beach whale, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm really not. But this girl was way older than what she portrayed herself to be, which was bad enough. But on top of that, she had to weigh almost 300 pounds. And she says, hey, how you doing? We've been talking on the phone this whole time. Barry busts out laughing. His girlfriend busts out laughing. The girl's feelings are absolutely hurt because they've lied to her and told her that they've given me pictures of her. And she was expecting me to accept her as she was. Now, I'm utterly disgusted at the sight of seeing this girl. The look on my face clearly hurts her feelings. She breaks down crying, turns around, and runs up the street. My mother is standing right next to me at the front door. I slam the door shut, and I'm pissed off. I go to stump off into my room. A few minutes later, my mother walks into the room, and she says, Boy, what the hell wrong with you? I'm like, Mama, they set me up with that ugly girl, and they think it's funny. And she said, Son... That girl's feelings are hurt just as hurt as yours. What I want you to do is get up, go outside, and go talk to that little girl. I said, Mama, she ain't even a little girl. I'm 12, 13. She got to be 14, 15. Son, that girl's feelings are hurt. And if you let this sit, it might hurt her forever. Trust me, go outside and talk to that girl. So now, imagine a scene. I got a long face on. I stump out the front door. They're still out there leaning on the car laughing. She's two houses down, sitting on the ground next to a pine tree. I walk up to her and I say, you know what? I'm sorry. I apologize. You just didn't look like what I expected you to look like. That's when she tells me, well, they told me they gave you pictures of me and that you really liked me. And, you know, we could be friends and da da da. I say, listen, we can still be friends. Honestly, we can still be friends. We've been talking on the phone this whole time. I just felt like I was deceived. I thought you was a part of it. You weren't a part of it. Fine. Well, she and I talk and we become friends. Not girlfriend, boyfriend, but become friends, right? Listen, four years later, bro. Four. One, two, three, four. I'm at a high school dance. And guess who walks into the dance? She done lost all that weight. She done got taller. She's slim. She's absolutely beautiful. Understand, I'm at this dance by myself. Barry is at this dance with one of his girlfriends. I didn't even recognize this girl. This is how good she looks. She walks up to me in front of him and kisses me on the cheek and asks me to dance. When I tell you she was the most attractive girl in this hands down most attractive girl in this dance. So we're out there on the dance floor. Keith Sweat is playing. Make it last forever and ever. Don't let our love in. 
Man, the best night of my life was hanging out with her. It just goes to show you. You never treat anybody the wrong way because you never know how things going to turn out in the end. Another phenomenal interview and this is a part of what we're doing to reach out to other creators in the community um, and, and, and what I'm doing right now is told to me to be done by God he told me hey James I want you to be a servant to everybody and so at this point in time I am reaching out to everybody that's in the crypto community and I want to help them in any way possible and make sure that you know they get some shine and some spotlight based on their contributions and it's one of those things that we've noticed in this community and we run into this wall over and over and over again. It's so much competition that we just, nobody can get along. Nobody, everybody's got to fight. Everybody got to argue. And so this is the Dark Waters family outreach where we're reaching out to everybody. If you're a subscriber here and you're listening to this, know what you're participating in and how important your participation is because we're getting ready to shift how things go. This evening, I have with me Mr. D.A. Roberts. And just in the pre-interview, just chopping it up and talking. I like this guy already. It's my first time talking to him, but he's ex-law enforcement and he's an author. And all of his books are based on the data that he's collected from real, real life witness encounters and reports. And then he has the stories that blend in both truth and fiction, which is very important because um, it allows us to actually have real data, but still be entertained at the same time. Mr. Roberts, how are you doing tonight? Are you doing well? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having for, me on. No, thank you for coming on with me because some people are scared to come on with me. They're like, oh, no, go. I'm going to get attacked if I talk to Dog Water. So I appreciate you coming in and hanging out with me for a solid hour and let's chop it up and talk but before we get into the meat of the conversation i want to give you an opportunity to tell people where to find you because i want them to subscribe to you now not later because they'll forget awesome. at the end of the interview where did where do they find you uh, you can find all of my books on my website which is daroberts.net uh, on any social media i've simplified things you can find me on any social media at da roberts author and my my uh, podcast is called dax Machina. you can find that on youtube at youtube.com slash da roberts author all right what does the da stand for bro <laughs> well it's my initials i uh I, I i usually don't tell everybody but it's uh, it's douglas allen okay now, man douglas is a cool name that's a classic name bro what you talking about you don't tell anybody that's classic douglas i'm i, I won't it's it's kind of uh kind of uh, interesting that uh you and i are doing the show together because in scotch gaelic douglas means from the dark water what you serious i'm serious wow that's crazy dude that that's insane well i just wanted to know so i knew what to refer to you as and you know as you start to build a relationship with people and this this won't be our last time talking um i'm an open book and open door if you ever need me to be able to reach out and contact me but i don't want to be calling you da so i can call you da for now but i want to know your real name so i appreciate you trusting okay. me with that um let's jump into it uh sure. So you're an author, you're a published author, you have a number of books, I looked them up that you published, you have a series of books. Um, what brought you into the cryptid field in general and uh, and made you start writing books? Because it, it, it takes something to get a person to the point where they're going to sit down and write about monsters. I, I want to know what that thing is. Well, one of the biggest things is, you know, when I, I grew up, I, I was born in the early 70s, so I grew up uh, right in that area where the Patterson-Gimlin film was still new, and you could see all the, uh, like, in, the old In Search Ofs with Leonard Demoy and those mysterious encounter so stories, and that's really kind of what 
first exposed me to, to, to the cryptid, to a cryptid subject. And of course, as a kid, I would go around and ask my siblings and cousins and aunts and uncles if they ever had a Bigfoot sighting. And most generally being, you know, a six, seven year old kid, they just kind of chuckled and, and went on their way. But one, one evening we were out at my, my, my uncle's place and he lived way out in the country. And he was married, and my uncle Buddy was married to my mo my mother's sister. Uh, uncle Buddy was his full blood Cherokee. It was he passed away recently, uh, but he was full blood Cherokee. And when one day when nobody else was around, I, he picked me up and set me on his leg, and he says, "He says, Doug, I'm going to tell you something." He said, "They're real." And I've seen them on this property. And from then on, I was absolutely 100% hooked because he was not the kind of guy who would spin yarns. He was he was a pretty straightforward, just very genuine guy, very hardworking, salt of the earth guy. And for him to just out and out, just straight out tell me that, that, that cemented it in my head that, that, that those were out there. And then later as a teenager on that very property, I had something approach my deer stand in the dark and it was approaching on two legs. And uh, I, I thought it was my uncle, but it was really sounded really heavy. I'm like, why is he stomping? And uh, so I called out and I was I was pretty far up on a tree stand. I was probably 12, 13 feet up in the air and it was a big walnut tree. No, I'm sorry. It was an oak. But anyway, uh, I, I said, hey, who's back there? Because I wasn't sure it was my uncle. And I heard something kind of take a deep breath like. <sighs> and then it turned and walked off. And by the time I could get out of that deer stand and look around the tree, it was gone. Um and, and that I, I went and asked my uncle about it. And he goes, well, you you just had a very close brush with with one of these big with a Bigfoot creature. And I said, are you sure? He goes, absolutely. There's nothing on this property that it could have been at, at that time. There were no no black bears in Missouri and hadn't been one in over 100 years. They've been reintroduced since then. But at the time, they, there weren't any. Uh, and then a year later on that same property in a different tree on the same with the same deer stand, I shot a 12 point buck. And before I could get to it, it had been taken. Wow. That's crazy. What did what exactly did he tell you they were? Did he kind of go into it or did he just tell you that they were here? Did he educate you on what they were like old stories of them? What kind of what kind of knowledge did he share with you? He he told me a lot of things that, you know, normally, uh, normally, you know, the tribes don't share, you know, because I was family. Um, but he uh, he told me, he said they that the Cherokee basically consider them just another tribe, like a like a brother. Um and that according to the the elders legends at one time they could actually converse uh, and there's stories of them you know trading items with them uh but those those stories have kind of faded you know they don't really that doesn't really happen so, uh, so much in the last 75 to 100 years but the the older generation told told of being able to trade with them and actually speak to them uh so i you know I'm going on what he told me and what what i've encountered uh, I, th I think he's he's spot on to something. I think there are groups of them that are very intelligent. And uh, I think much like the temperament among people, I think there are others that are very dangerous. But you find that in people as well. No, I agree with you. There are some people who are extremely dangerous. I'm, I'm, I would love to know more about how they were able to converse with them. Because when you hear the encounters from people mm -hmm. and, and they talk about the samurai chatter. Just last mm -hmm. night I was on with Carrie Arnold. And Kerry mimicked the sound that uh, the Bigfoot was making during his encounter. And I'm telling you, it sounded like he said, man, I felt like it was fussing at me, like it was complaining and it was angry. And I would love to know, you know, I, and I, there's probably no way to go back and trace that unless you just found an elder that would really share, really share that information. I would love to know how they were able to converse with these things. And well, how what they were I was able told to by my uncle is they spoke a rudimentary form of Cherokee. Oh, that makes sense. That makes a he's, lot of sense. He's a, a lot of it was more guttural, more grunts and groans. But according to his grandfather, they they spoke uh, enough Cherokee to get their point across. Wow, wow, that's that's amazing. That might be. You know what? When I when I do relaunch this camera project, I think my 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 field investigator I'm gonna make sure they know how to speak some Cherokee or have some like written Cherokee that they practice just to see if they can get a reaction from them. That would be very, very interesting. You taught me something. I, I didn't know that. So that gives me an angle to, to try things from. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So this has been something from your childhood that was an interest from you. And then walk me through how you get from being that child to your first book. How did you just decide that we were going to write your first book? What did you decide to put in it? How did you get to that point?
I understand where you started, but how did you get there? Yeah, I want. I wanted to be a writer. Uh, since I was a kid, uh, my mother, uh, I, growing up in the seventies in the country, as we lived on a farm North of Lebanon, Missouri, which is a, and by no means a big city. And it was even smaller back in the seventies, but, um, living out there, we had like two television channels and I didn't watch much TV. And she taught me to read very early age before I was in kindergarten, I could read. And we, uh, she would just read stories to me or have me read stories to her. And it really inspired a love of, of love of the written word. And as I got older, reading more and more other authors, I wanted to write, I wanted to, to be a writer in my own right. Uh, but what made me want to write horror was my mother and I used to sit in the late evenings and watch Kolchak the Night Stalker, which is, you know, my homage to the hat here. Uh, but that, that early horror, those are that early horror series really made me want to write horror. And I, it seemed like a natural progression to combine my my love of cryptids with my writing. That's awesome. Now, when you were in law enforcement, did you happen to have any creepy, scary encounters when you were in law enforcement? Did was there anything that kind of fostered it or um, fostered that that sense of being a writer while you were in law enforcement? I understand that being in law enforcement, you you definitely learned how to read people mm -hmm. and collect data and 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 find out the truth of things. But was there anything that happened in that time period of your life where it was spooky, creepy, or you encountered anything? Oh, well, nothing cryptid related. But I had a few instant incidences incidents where it could only have been paranormal. Uh, I I in fact once while uh, working the old hospital. I saw a full body apparition in the chapel uh, and, and it just absolutely terrified me because I, I didn't know I, there was nobody supposed to be in that secured section where the chapel was at. It was locked down for the night. And I went in to tell the guy he couldn't be there and he was gone. Uh, and there was the, the only way out was past me. I mean, I literally saw him. And when I went to approach, he was gone in the blink of an eye. Um, so I've had a few a few things that uh, could only have been paranormal. Uh, there was one hospital room, one in the old part of the hospital where I would walk by in rounds, and they used it as a training center. It wasn't wasn't like it was beds they used for the for actual patients. It was part of the school, so the beds were were empty in this this section. It was used just for training, and you would walk by one room and the TV would be on, and I'd go in and shut it off, and then come back, you know, a couple hours later on my rounds, and it'd be on again. And I thought, well, that's weird. So I turned it off. And the third time when I came by and it was still on, I unplugged it. And I came back a couple hours later and it was on again. Uh, so I just left it alone and <laughs> went on my way. But uh, clearly something in that room wanted to watch television. Nah, man, those hospitals are creepy. Um, man, I, I know uh, Maritza, New York, Maritza from New York, she worked in hospitals and and she was one of my very early followers. I need to call her and check on her, see what's going on with her. But she had so many creepy hospital encounters as a nurse that it was to the point to where, you know, it traumatized her. Um, that hospital was a, is a place where there's a lot of death. There's a lot of life. There's a lot of cycle of life going on in that place. And I mean, it's, it's totally ridiculous, man, the things that people have seen in hospitals. So you've been... This has touched your life throughout your whole life. So I can understand how you got to a point where you say, hey, I really want to write about this. And whether it be from, you know, watching TV to your grandfather to being a cop, um, let's go into some of the books and some of the things that you touch on the books. Have you touched on Dogman uh, in your books? And I, you have to forgive me because I haven't had an opportunity to read any of them. Have you touched on Dogman much? Yeah, I've used Dogman quite extensively. Um in fact, one series, the series is called the Apex Predator series. My newest novel is in that series. I've got uh, four series running at the same time. But in the Apex Predator series, it's about a group of Native Americans who hunt dangerous cryptids. They hunt they hunt dogman specifically, but they do have run-ins with other, other cryptids. Uh, but I built that off the Cherokee legend of the Hotametaneo, or the dog soldiers. And according to... to uh, to uh, Cheyenne and Lakota legend, the strongest of the dog soldiers were actually able to change form. So I worked that in as part of the legend, and eventually the character, the the characters on that team, uh, developed the ability to shift into a wolf form, and then they they use that to help help them hunt dangerous cryptids like Dogman. And is that the name that you use? I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. How does that relate to the theory of skinwalkers? Is that the same thing, or is that 
two completely neighborhood, two different neighborhoods, two cities, or is that yeah, all on the same street? What? How does they're, that? They're relate very to each different. Other? Uh, the Skinwalkers uh, gained the ability to shift, cha shape change by going about as as dark magic as you could possibly go, basically tarnishing their soul so bad they're corrupted, and they gain the ability to to mimic other forms. And according to uh, one of my friends who grew up on the Navajo reservation, they can take any form from insect to animal to even other humans and uh it's you know they're a very dangerous dangerous thing but the 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 dog soldiers from from cherokee and lakota legend uh were warriors that were defending the the natives against uh the the incursion of basically european settlers coming west okay gotcha gotcha i I've heard a little bit about that. I didn't know that's what the name of it was. So the books are based on that. And what kind of things outside of that, what other things did you blend in from like people's real life encounters? How did you weave that into the book? Give me some examples of things that you, other things that you kind of weaved into those stories. Well, for example, um, you take it, some of the accounts, uh, especially like if you look at some of the missing 411 and how they, you know, how they uh, very very carefully step around saying what is making people disappear. Yeah. Um, well, you, you, you look into some of the more dangerous accounts, like some of the accounts out of Alaska, there was a guy, there was a story of a guy who was fishing off of the Kenai peninsula and he was sleeping on his boat. And one of the, one of a Bigfoot came aboard his boat, killed his dog and almost killed him before he drove it off, uh, drove it off. And he made it back to port before he died and passed the story on. Um, but, uh, you know, you get these dangerous encounters and I've, I've studied these encounters. I've talked to people who've had aggressive encounters as well. And I've, I've used those behaviors like the rock throwing or the chest beating, um, you know, wood knocks, uh, all the, all the typical expressions you would encounter with a Bigfoot story. But I take those and I kind of add the, at the nth degree, like the missing 411 cases, we never know exactly what happens to them. And if it is a dangerous cryptid, you can only imagine the carnage that would ensue. So I took the accounts leading up to that disappearance point where people were still coming back. And then I added my own details to, to bring in the, the dangerous elements. No, that's a smart way to do it. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to write, that's the only way to write a story is blend the two of them together. Cause essentially it's based on truth. Um, it's just that uh, you're portraying the rest of the story. What I was, I just lost my train of thought. I was going to ask you about, um wow i must be getting tired it, it's been a long day i was going to touch on oh this is what i was going to say i was going to touch on a missing 411 and one of the things that and i don't really mention it but one of the theories that i have is um especially the people who go missing in the appalachians mm -hmm. is the theory of the the feral people that are out there um yeah. I've had a bunch of stories come in recently because I've been targeting that area with marketing and with like um, newspaper articles and just little things to get people to call me. And I did not know how bad it was that there were people, actually human beings who were feral human beings that were cannibals that lived in the Appalachians. I didn't know that. I had heard of it, but when you start getting people calling you and they're like, yeah, you put an article, ask, I had this encounter. I'm like, wait, what? It, it was a trap, a, a deadfall trap. Yeah, it was a deadfall trap. And I was 15 miles away from anybody and it missed me. And then I heard people coming in and I'm like, man, that's crazy. That That's absolutely insane. Have you heard anything about feral people? That's something I want to dig into. I have thought, I've heard some of the stories about people because well, there's a, good, a considerable number of people that go missing along the Appalachian Trail that are just never found. Uh, I've heard the stories of feral uh, feral people. I've heard the sheep squatch and you know, Bigfoot legends along the Appalachian Trail. Um, but you know, it's 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 not just limited to there. I mean, look uh, look at the uh, swamps of Louisiana. The stories of the night people who will come out and, and take people, especially, you know, children who are out past, uh, past dark and things like that. So the, 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 the possibility of feral people, people living that far off the grid into the end of the boonies uh, who might prey on people or whatever they can find uh, isn't not only, it's not that, that far fetched, but I don't think it's localized to just Appalachia. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. That just threw me for a loop, bro, because I, it's, that's the thing. When I talk to witnesses, it's, it's like a crash course education in like a geographical area. 
-hmm. And so we go through this process where we talk about their encounter, and then I start digging. Like, I pull out a shovel. I'm like, tell me about your grandma. Tell me about your great-grandpa. Tell me about your auntie. And I'm just digging and digging and digging. And then once they finally open up, I'm like, what did I just stumble upon? And it's just, it's insane to me, man. I'm looking forward to producing some of those stories. Um, what's your favorite dog man encounter that you've heard so far out of all the dogs? Because there's a plethora of dog man encounters. And that could be a story or uh, anything. What's the one that sticks out to you the most? The one that sticks out to me the most that, that I find just to be not only the most intriguing but the most most heart palpitating is your rendition of the siege at locket ranch absolutely love that yeah that that encounter man i went through hell <laughs> to get that when i say i went through hell to get that i went through hell to get my hands on that and um and then it was it was such a long process of trying to get it right mm -hmm. i mean it really was a long process of trying to get that right and that was that was the first big one, and that was the first. I said, man, I'm going to put everything into this. I'm going to get every detail right. I'm going to ask questions over and over and over again, and I'm going to figure it out. And I spent so much time on that porch in the sun, burning up, and people looking at me like I was crazy, bro. But I spent a lot of time getting that story. Um, well, it shows because you did a fantastic job. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm thinking about re-recording it with updated music and sound effects, mm -hmm. but every time I try and I listen to it to re-record it, I'm like, bro, leave that alone. Just leave it as is. You know what I'm saying? I don't yeah, think you can do it any better. It's pretty fantastic just the way it is. I, lo I love it. I've, I've listened to it multiple times over the last few years. No, nah, it's it's, a, it's one hell of an encounter, um, and I, I love it. Um, when we go from that to what's the favorite Dogman story that you've been able to produce and create for your audience? Which one sticks out to you? I would say the one that I, I still find the most intriguing uh, for, for of my books, that is, is the first book of the Apex Predator series, Apex Predator Wolf Moon. And that's when you get the shock value. Uh, that were, you know, in the later books, people are expecting to see Dogman or Dangerous Cryptids. But finding, you know, the, the, the villain is not just a dangerous animal. It's a bipedal wolf. That moment of revelation is, is I think, my, my favorite part that I've done so far. And it's, it's, it's something I've thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, with the book I'm working, now, working on now, I think, uh, I think I've stumbled onto something that's going to have just as much shock value. So uh, looking forward to this book getting out and seeing what people think. Have you have you taken those books and like had them on Audible where it's like an audio book for people to listen to or is it only in print? I have a few of them out in Audible, uh, but we're working on getting the others out. It, the The thing with 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 transcribing books to audio is it's time consuming, uh, and you've got to find the right narrator to find the voice. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm in the process of of narrowing down my choices, and I've got several several of the books out in audio already, uh, but I'm looking forward to getting more of them out because I think audio is a great market. No, it's a phenomenal market, and um, what it does is it really allows people to get immersed inside the story. And mm -hmm. and they learn lessons from being immersed inside of those stories. I, and I just think it's amazing that I've talked to authors before and I would do interviews and I would delete them. Right. Because they'll, they'll be like, oh, my stuff is pure fiction. I'll say, hey, well, do you base it on anything? Do you base it on any real legends or any of this? And, and I'll, I'll ask the percentage and they'll be like, oh, it's maybe 7 percent, 10 percent. And I'm like, I'm not about to put this interview out. Delete. <laughs> like, done. I'm not I'm not doing this, bro. It's too much information out there for you to just be willy nilly making stuff up. And the people in the Williams family don't use right. the word willy nilly lightly. If I say <laughs> you're being willy nilly, you're really being willy nilly. So I just think it's too much information out there that a person can use to portray an accurate picture to an audience. Um, so I like the fact that that's what you're doing. You're taking real facts and then you're crafting a narrative around them that that is in line with what everybody else is doing and it makes it entertaining and entertainment is a huge part of this that's you know that's what i kind of pride myself on taking those encounters real life encounters and making people feel them and become entertained by them but also they know it's real they know it's not made yeah. up because it doesn't it doesn't sound like it's made up because it came from a, a person or an individual let's swing over to um outside of dog man because you know honestly uh DA, I get tired of talking about dog, man, but I hit it early. That's why I hit it early. What about any other weird cryptids um, reports that you've come across? Something that's just completely off the beaten path, way out in the, if like the normal dog man area is in New York, we're talking about take me down to 
uh, Antarctica with something that you've heard about that's just way off the beaten path that you find interesting? Well, one of the one of the legends that I've I've dug into, and uh, I'm I'm Missouri hillbilly, Ozarks born and bred. Uh, I lived I lived in the in the hills of Missouri pretty much my whole life. Uh, is one of the legends that I that I came across was an Ozarks folklore legend called the Ozarks Howler, and according to lore, Daniel Boone actually killed one. Okay, uh, had it as part of his collection, and there have been sightings within the last three or four years here in Missouri of the Ozarks Howler. And it basically it's described as a hellhound with horns, a gigantic dog about the size of a bear. Uh, but it has horns on the back of its head facing, facing backwards. And the eyes are said to glow red. Um, one of the, one of the books I wrote is called the beast of Blunk road. And it's about, it's about the, uh, about the Ozarks Howler. And I actually went to the locations where the sightings occurred uh, to, to get a feel for the area, and one of the things I, I, I like to like to point out, and I, I don't know if a lot or a lot of authors realize this, but literally everything an author does is research. My time in uniform was prepped me for writing about how you know not only military but how law enforcement react. I try to make the behaviors of the characters the way way cops really react. Um, you know the the gallows humor that we have sometimes, uh, the sarcastic comments made to each other. I try to make the characters not just not just words on paper, but I try to make the characters as much flesh and blood as I possibly can. Uh, like I've got I've got one character in my codename Wild Hunt series, which is about a, a military unit that hunts hunts monsters. Uh, and his name is his name's Margolin, and everybody seems to like that guy. Uh, but he he's one of those characters where sometimes when I'm writing the dialogue, even I'm astounded what comes out of his mouth. I mean, he, he, I've just got the, the, such a good picture in my head of the way these characters react. Sometimes the story ends up changing based on the character's reaction from the direction I wanted it to go to being driven by the characters. So you can't. If you're writing your characters well, if you're giving your characters personality and you're making the characters as realistically realistic as you can, you can't force them to react the way you want them to. They need to react naturally, and that sometimes really does help shape the story. Shape the stories. Man, I'm I'm a I'm gonna tell you something. I'm, I'm this is gonna end up being public, but I'm gonna say something, bro, that I probably never said before. When I started doing the series that led into. Um, uh, the Lion Men of Judah and mm -hmm. the Wing ones, and I started talking to those guys, and I first started holding those conversations, and it was like they sent me a phone to talk to them on, and I started talking, and then every month those guys would like switch out phones, and they would mail me another phone, and we would talk, and then I would get another phone, and we would talk, and then I started getting packages in the mail with documents and corporation documents. Man, you know, for me, that's one can of worms i wish i never opened because like when you really dig into what goes on on this planet and what's behind the curtain and you understand like wow there are people out here who hunt dna of uh creatures that are creatures of the night that you wouldn't believe exists and then they take that dna and they trade it on the open market and then they use the dna for things like what's being rolled out in people right now, man, I'm, I'm telling you, DA, that it got to a point for me, and I don't even know why I'm talking about this. I just It just hit me. It got to a point for me where I was like, man, what have I got myself into? Like, what, how, like, I, it's, you know how you, you dig a hole and you're like, man, I'm deep underground. I'm looking up. I can still see the sky. And then you get so deep when you look up, you don't see nothing but the hole. And I was like, man, I don't know how you get out of this because, for me, like when you started getting into, and you're you're a, a law, you're in law enforcement, you understand when you start talking to people and you're twisting their words and interrogating them. I mean, hardcore interrogation techniques, like in the middle of their sentence, in you know, injecting something, and it's everybody, and you're trying to trick and fool everybody, and everybody has the same damn story, and everybody has the same details, and everybody describes the exact same thing to the T, the exact same outfits, the, and there is no inconsistencies. Man, that that's that was one of the most terrifying things for me to come to the realization that the world that we live in is a world that only, it's kind of like the internet iceberg drawing. You know how they have that, that iceberg drawing of the internet where they say like there's the deep web and all that mm -hmm. stuff is underwater and then there's like here's the public web? 
it's mm-hmm. kind of like that. It's like, okay, here's where you exist, and it's this tip of this iceberg, and then, well, bam, everything else is down there, and nobody knows about it, and the people who do know about it, um, they fight each other over it, and you see it playing out in the news, man. Anyway, I'm, let me stop. That's that's horrifying. We're supposed to be talking about you. Um, where were we? I, I this this howler from the Ozarks. I've never mm-hmm. heard of it. That sounds absolutely terrifying. Um, how many witness eyewitness encounters would you say you had or you've heard about as far as, far as it pertains to that? As for personally gathering, only a handful. Uh, mm-hmm. But historical accounts date back to the first column, uh, the first uh, first uh, settlers that came to Missouri. Uh, it, it's been spotted in this area for the last almost two hundred years. I mean, as long as Missouri was settled in the year in the early eighteen hundreds, and it's been reported since then. In fact, uh, there's even reports of a dogman like creature they used to refer to the, you refer to as the beast of the valley. Uh, but that valley is gone now underneath the waters of Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, but every once in a while, you still hear hear somebody refer to the beast in that area and once in a while it's still seen i'm of the opinion that across um america that there have been locations where these cryptids have lived and that intentionally our federal government has flooded those areas out to take over mm-hmm. that territory and run them out of that territory because there are multiple locations where i know that there was activity at some point in time heavy activity documented by families that those areas were flooded hands down mm-hmm. flooded lakes man-made lakes created on those areas well, and the like lake land between the lakes used to be land between the rivers right and it's been exactly and i and, and when you think about it you wonder why our federal government would do that and it makes it kind of makes sense if there's something there that you want to hide mm-hmm. and something that you don't want people to discover just flood it just flood it out and nobody knows about it unless somebody's a, nosy and they decide to go underwater looking for it. Mm-hmm. Well, I have another theory that kind of ties right into that. Okay. Uh, hit something me I've it. been been working on trying to doc- trying to document as much as I can over the last couple of years. One of the earliest written accounts of a Bigfoot sighting was in the book The Wilderness Hunter by Teddy Roosevelt. The Bauman incident, as it's, fa- as it's famously known. Uh, but Roosevelt writes with that writes about that with such detail. And I know Missouri hillbilly hillbillies and people that live out in the woods. They just don't give that kind of detail. So for him to have the level of detail he has. Uh, I've talked to a few people, and and, he, and I'm not the only one that thinks this, since this was pre-politics when Roosevelt was still looking at his career in politics you know, ahead of him, that he wrote the Bauman incident and changed the name, that it was actually him. So taking that as an assumption that Roosevelt knew about cryptids, which even if he was just heard about it secondhand, he knew about Bigfoot creatures, then... Flash forward, what is one of the first things Teddy Roosevelt does in office? He created the National Park Service, which which cordoned off millions of acres that we still don't have full access to. No, that makes perfect sense, man. That makes perfect sense. Uh, and I never thought about it that way. That makes absolute perfect sense. You know what bothers me, though, out of all of this is um, the people who fall victim to this. That's the one thing that bothers me. But I, I've, I've spoken to people, D.A., in very high places that in, in some cases it was threatening in other cases it's gotten to the point where it's just like hey man we really like you you're pretty cool we know your background blah 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 you're a cool dude but you know be careful about a b c d e f g you know just be mindful of saying blah 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 and the one question i've always asked those gentlemen and i and i say this they're gonna hear this i say this with the utmost respect is i say how do you sleep at night when you know that somebody's kid went missing and or someone's family member went missing and they haven't been able to give me a straight answer and they just say that's above my pay grade um i just do my job and that's the one thing that gets me about the whole cryptid uh dog man bigfoot and the other things that are out there that you know people don't disclose and i'm smart enough now i don't want to be first in talking about anything so there's things that i think are going to hit our community relatively soon i don't want to be first Yes, yes, good, good. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Now it is time for you to make a decision. Decide what you will do. Will you become a member at imdogwaters.com today to hear the rest of this interview? 
or will you sit back and stay here on YouTube missing out on some of the best content in the world? It is your choice. I will not rush you. Take your time and decide. But that is all you get for today. Before I start the story, let me say this. I knew about Dogman before I ever heard of a Dogman encounter. In fact, I knew about Dogman before I even knew it was called Dogman. Because my grandmother here in the Appalachians used to call it the Wolf of the Fog. I distinctly remember her saying, boy, when it's foggy outside, stay out of them woods. And, that, and her going on to explain to me that there were multiple things in the woods that would take you when you least expected it. Now, as I grew older and became a man and started spending time in the woods hunting, her words began to fade away. And you know how it is, man, I was 23 years old in the prime of my youth and I thought I was invincible. Well, turns out, I was just stupid. Because this particular morning, I'm not in my right mind. My girlfriend and I are having a spat, she's on some next level crazy foolishness, just arguing because she needs attention. We spent the previous night on the phone with her just aggravating and digging at me for no reason whatsoever. And in turn, I didn't get much sleep. Now imagine the scene, I'm restless, it's 6.30 in the morning and she calls me again, telling me that she wants to come over because we need to talk. And I'm not sure if you ever found yourself in a situation where you just wanted to flee, you know, run and get away. That's how I was. I just wanted to get away from it all and my solace when everything was going wrong in my life has always been the woods. However, when I open my front door and walk outside, it's this dense fog everywhere. But like I told you before, I wasn't in my right mind. So I just keep walking, trapped in thoughts, not thinking about anything except for why in the hell is she acting this way? A few minutes later, I cross the road and walk into the woods. And I want to be clear with you, walking into these woods, even though it was foggy, it wasn't scary to me at all. These woods across the street from my house were my second home. So I'm just walking along the trail. I've been on this trail for years, could walk it and find it with my eyes closed. Even traveled this thing at night, never had an issue finding my way back home. Now, I get no more than 300 to 400 yards along that trail in the fog. In the same fog which was just sitting there resting in the air, I notice it starts to roll and move. But there's no wind blowing. Understand, it's strange and spooky, but we live in the mountains. And these mountains have updrafts and downdrafts that cause the fog to rise and fall. And there are even times where you're in the woods and you will literally see a wall of fog rolling down the mountain through the trees coming in your direction. Now, for somebody who's not used to it, it looks like freaking Armageddon is heading your way. For, however, for somebody like me, it's just a part of life. And the reason why I tell you that is because I want you to understand why I just kept walking, thinking nothing of it as this fog began to swarm me. But then something happens that forces me out of that mental state of confusion and quickly snaps me back into reality. Because I begin to hear these voices in the woods. And by voices, I don't mean people talking, I just mean whispering. It's not quite loud enough for me to make out what's being said, but it's just loud enough for me to know that something is being said. Then seconds after I hear that whispering, I hear a twig snap. The sound is loud off in the distance, but at the same time it gives me chills. You know like the skin on my arm is like chicken skin. Those little bitty bumps are everywhere. Now I want to reiterate to you again, I've been in the woods my whole life. These woods are like my home and I know when the woods feel bad. And it doesn't necessarily mean something's bad in the woods. It just means the woods feel bad. And all of a sudden, they feel bad. So I decide, you know what? I'm turning around and headed back home. Now, imagine a scene. Now I'm working my way back home. And this feeling of doom comes over me. And by doom, this feeling like I'm about to die comes over me. 
And I need you to understand, this emotion and feeling is completely alien to me. I never been in the woods and felt like I was going to die for no freaking reason. In fact, the only time in my life where I ever felt this type of doom and dread, it was when I was drinking and driving my pickup truck. Went around this curve, flipped that truck over, and started to slide on the highway. And the only thing that saved my life was the guardrail. Had that guardrail broken, my truck would have tumbled 500 something feet, and I would have died a fiery death. And the feeling that I was having in the woods at that moment was equivalent to the feeling that I had during that accident. And it didn't make any sense to me at all in that moment. Like I said, it's foggy outside. I'm working my way back home, walking down this trail when something darts past me and I get a quick glimpse and it's a deer. Seconds later, another deer, then another deer, then another deer. All of them running past me. One running so close, I could reach out and touch it. A coyote comes running up behind me, darts off to my right, looks me in the eye as it's running past me. And now, all of a sudden I find myself standing there confused, my mind trying to process the information that's being given to it. I'm thinking, okay, all these animals are fleeing the woods, what in the world could make them run like this? <clears throat> bear, a coyote, a wolf, a fox, a bear, a coyote, a wolf, a fox. You know how slot machines have those images on it, right? You pull the handle and it's got like cherries and grapes and numbers and it rolls and it scrolls and it circles and it circles and as it slows down you start to see these different symbols. Well that's kind of what's going on in my mind. Images are rolling through my mind and I'm trying to process and figure out what in the world could be causing this. Now I need you to understand to be clear with you I hadn't even realized that I stopped walking. My brain is processing every piece of information about the woods that I've experienced since I was a child. And I cannot come up with any solution to this problem. Then I hear my grandmother's voice in the back of my head saying, There are things in that fog that will take you when you least expect it. Listen, when I tell you an alarm goes off in my body, Warning, warning, danger, danger, warning, warning, danger, danger. Dude, my feet start running without me even thinking about it. Now I'm running full speed up that trail, my mind only thinking about getting out of these woods and getting home. About five minutes later, I emerge out of the woods, make a sharp right, and run across the street to my front porch. Imagine the scene. I'm standing there on the front porch looking back at the woods. The fog is rolling over the road, and I'm trying to figure out what the hell is going on, and I see birds, a flock of birds flying through the fog coming out of the woods and that was it I knew deep down inside in my heart that something horrific was coming through those woods I just didn't know what it was a moments later a black bear appears right at the edge of the tree line rooting around in the grass moments later a black bear appears right at the edge of the tree line it's rooting around sniffing and I'm thinking to myself okay all right that makes sense this black bear is out hunting and that explains what I was feeling, right? Mm-mm, hell no, wrong, 120% wrong. Because that bear is standing there sniffing around, then it turns around and stands up on two legs, facing the woods and begins to roar. Like it is warding off something. That's when I see with my own two eyes this gigantic black furry dog the size of two and one half of those black bears emerge from the woods and in one freaking motion hit that bear, send it tumbling backwards into the road. Then as the bear is tumbling, this thing launches itself into the air, lands and bites down on that bear's neck. Now, 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 let me pause right here and explain something to you. I know there are a lot of people who share stories that are untrue. I understand why they do it. They want to be popular. They want to be liked. They want to be loved. Listen, I don't give a damn about Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. I don't care about none of that. In fact, the only internet I have is on my cell phone, and that's spotty based on the location that I'm in. So when I tell you what I saw, I'm not telling you this because I'm trying to win some popularity contest. I'm telling you this because this scared the living hell out of me. It bites a bear on the neck, 
wiggles its head, breaks that bear's neck, and then walks off on all fours, dragging that bear like it was absolutely nothing. Goes back uphill and into those woods. Listen to me, when I tell you I couldn't believe my own eyes, I couldn't believe my own freaking eyes. So I waited two hours until the fall began to lift, walked up the road, and I had to put my fingers in that blood for myself just to see if I was hallucinating. And when my fingers touched this bear's blood, I realized that the things in the mountains that my grandmother told me about were 100% true. That's the end of my story. But that's not the end of the knowledge that my grandmother passed on to me. You, you see, I thought a lot of the things she told me were like old wives' tales, you know, things that they used to talk about while they were knitting and sewing clothes. Oh, no, 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 no. In my mind, if that thing was real, then it meant that the giant trees that she told me about that could get up and walk and move were real. It meant that the giant men, not Bigfoots, but the giant men that lived in the Appalachian Mountains were real. It meant that everything that my grandmother ever shared with me, everything she had ever warned me about, was real. That's what I'm having trouble digesting even till this day. And me sharing this story with you is just a part of me coming to terms with I don't know anything at all. Everything I thought to be true is wrong.